Henry. Chapter One Denley House, Lancashire, England, 1794 There's always something special about the first ball of the season, don't you think so, Grace? Miriam Kendall, the daughter of the Baron of Mowbray, said excitedly, looking out of the carriage window as it pulled up the long drive towards Denley House. Grace Villier was nervous. This was her first season. She knew nothing of what to expect, save for what Miriam, her closest friend and her mother, the Countess of Dilbury, had told her. Miriam was only a year older than Grace, but the difference between them was marked. In all ways, Grace felt her friend to be superior. Her own first season had, by all accounts, passed effortlessly, and she had been feted across the ton as a bell of the ball. Grace was not convinced the same would be said of her. She was naturally shy and retiring, qualities her mother had despaired of. A shy violet never gets the sun, she had told Grace that very afternoon, chastising her for being less than enthusiastic as to the first ball of the season. It was, her mother had told her, every young lady's dream to blossom in her first season and to attract the attentions of eligible young bachelors. But Grace's dreams were rather more mundane at least in her mother's eyes. She enjoyed playing the pianoforte, reading books in her father's library, and painting. But that had been her childhood, and change was coming. It was about to arrive, for the carriage was now pulling up outside Denley House, the home of the Duke and Duchess of Bridbury, who were to host the first ball of the season that very evening. I think... I feel rather unwell, Grace replied, looking out of the carriage window at the stream of guests making their way up the wide steps into the house, where liveried footmen stood stiffly on either side of the large double doors. Miriam smiled at her. You'll be quite all right. That's why I'm here, and I'm so glad your parents allowed you to ride with me. Look, they're here now, her friend replied, pointing out of the window. Grace could see her mother stepping imperiously from her father's carriage, dressed in peacock blue with a plumage for a fascinator. Her mother had, by her own admission, been the most popular of debutantes and had received no less than a dozen marriage proposals. It was this legacy which made it all the harder for Grace to follow in her footsteps. How could she ever compete with that? I wish they'd just let me get on with it. I can just imagine what it's going to be like in there. Grace said, as now the footman that had accompanied them jumped down from the buckboard and opened the carriage door. Take a deep breath. You might even enjoy it, Miriam said, and climbing out of the compartment, she beckoned Grace to follow. Grace knew she had no choice. It was a rite of passage, one which every young lady went through. Others would be making their first appearance amongst society that evening, and Grace looked around her to see several young women she knew, each smiling gaily and hurrying up the steps to join the throng. They did not look nervous in the slightest. I'm not sure about that, but... Grace began, just as a shrill voice interrupted her. Come along, Grace. You'll find yourself with the dregs if you don't hurry. No one wants their dance card marked by the third son or the offspring of a clergyman, her mother said. Grace turned to find her mother and father arm in arm, looking at her pointedly. She was their only child, a source of some shame on the part of the Earl, whose title would go to a distant cousin rather than his own offspring. He raised his eyebrows pointedly as Grace's mother tutted. We're just going in, mother. I'm sure Miriam won't let me be disappointed, Grace replied. I assure you, Lady Dilbury. I'll make sure Grace's dance card is marked by only the most eligible bachelors, Miriam replied. The Countess's countenance softened. Grace had always believed her mother would have preferred Miriam as a daughter, and it seemed the Baron's daughter's words now appeased her. You're such a dear, Miriam. Do give my regards to your parents. I must call on your mother in the coming weeks. We've just been so busy lately. A debutante doesn't ready herself, does she? 
Grace's mother replied. Miriam smiled and agreed before taking Grace firmly by the arm and leading her up the steps. They greeted several others as they went, or rather, Miriam greeted them, and Grace smiled politely. She knew only a handful of people, and whilst an occasion such as this was meant to be a time of introduction, Grace would gladly have returned home. I suppose this is the first step, isn't it? she whispered as they presented their cards to the Master of Ceremonies. That's right. Once you're inside, that hard bit's over, Miriam replied. They had entered through the large double doors into a marbled hallway with doors leading off on either side. A queue of elegantly dressed ladies and handsome young men had formed, awaiting their introductions. And there was much laughter and conversation as the names of the guests were called, and Grace's and Miriam's turn approached. The lady, Grace Dilbury, debutante, daughter of the Earl and Countess of Dilbury, and the Lady Miriam Kendall, daughter of the Baron and Lady Mowbray, the Master of Ceremonies announced. Grace and Miriam entered the ballroom, which was already full of people milling about in conversation and introductions before the dancing began. It was a grand room, marbled and hung with red satin banners. A wide staircase led up to a gallery above, where several of the guests stood watching the proceedings below. Grace looked around her with interest. It would have been a delightful place to be had she not been so nervous. Ah, Lady Grace, how glad we are to see you on your debut. I presume your mother is behind you. A voice to Grace's left said, and she turned to find a tall lady wrapped in a silk shawl smiling at her. It was her hostess, the Duchess of Bridbury, and now Grace fell into a deep curtsy, just as her mother had taught her. She is, Lady Bridbury, and how grateful I am to you for your kind invitation, Grace replied. The Duchess smiled. I'm sure you'll meet some delightful people here this evening. You might find the son of the Earl of Pendle an interesting prospect. And there's the Baron of Chester too, he's over there, she replied, nodding in the direction of a rotund man holding forth at the side of the room. Grace smiled and nodded, though inwardly she felt despairing. She had known what to expect, even as she had no experience of her own as to such occasions. Miriam had explained it to her, how the women would await the attentions of a man who would ask her to dance. There would be a dalliance and conversations, perhaps an invitation to call on one another in the coming days. First impressions were what mattered, and Grace could hear her mother's voice in her mind, reminding her of the necessity of appearance. Thank you, Lady Bridbury. I'll bear your suggestions in mind, Grace replied. Their hostess now turned to greet the next arrivals and Miriam rolled her eyes. The Earl of Pendle's son is nothing but a lecherous rake. He's simply awful, and as for the Baron of Chester, he's so rotund you'd be marrying two men, not one, she said. Grace laughed. And what are we to do, she replied for she knew her mother would not settle for anything less than three marks to her dance card. She had said as much during their preparations. The first ball of the season sets the tone for what's to come, Grace. If you're not noticed now, you never will be, her mother had told her. Grace wanted to please her mother. She had talked of nothing else but Grace's debut for months. A new dress, in peach and mauve, had been purchased from a fashionable modiste in Lancaster, along with new shoes and shawl. Grace had attended dancing lessons and practised walking and comportment. This was her mother's moment and Grace did not want to disappoint her. We'll choose our own gentlemen, the ones we want to notice us, Miriam replied with a pointed expression on her face. Grace smiled. She knew Miriam would not let her down. They had been friends for many years and because she did not have a sister of her own, Grace had always looked up to Miriam as an example of what she should aspire to. Miriam's own debut had passed without a hitch, and she had been feted by most every eligible young man in the district. She had several suitors, and it was to be a case of when, not if, she was to marry. But what if the ones we choose aren't interested in us? Grace replied. Miriam gave her a sympathetic look and shook her head. <laughs> 
You're the pretty, vivacious, delightful daughter of an earl. What's not to like, Grace? She replied. Grace laughed. She did not think of herself as pretty. Her hair was not long enough, her cheekbones not high enough, her mouth was too small, her nose had a dimple in it she detested. As for being vivacious, she did not believe that about herself either. She was shy and retiring. She did not put herself forward in conversation, nor, despite her mother's insistence, did she make any effort to involve herself in society. I don't think I'm anything like that, Grace replied, but Miriam was having none of it. Come now, Grace. Don't be a retiring violet. We'll get some punch, and then we'll see who might have noticed us, Miriam said, taking Grace by the arm. They made their way through the throng of guests. Miriam seemed to know everyone, and whilst Grace was able to bask in her radiance, her friend's popularity did nothing for her own attraction. She was second to Miriam in every way, and despite it being her debut, Grace would gladly have gone straight home without dancing a single step. Look, there's Harold Shanks, Miriam said, pointing to a tall Anne in the red uniform of an officer of the militia. He was standing at the edge of the dance floor, talking to another man who had his back to them. The musicians were tuning up their instruments, and the time for the dancing was about to begin. But we're not expected to dance the first dance, are we? Grace exclaimed, looking around her at the other debutantes, all of whom appeared to have found partners for themselves. Again, Miriam looked at her sympathetically. Oh, Grace, there's nothing to be worried about. You've danced plenty of times before. We've practised enough, haven't we? She replied. Grace smiled. They had practised on numerous occasions, but humming themselves around her father's drawing room and falling into fits of laughter as they stepped on one another's toes was not the same as dancing with a gentleman at a ball on the evening of her debut. A stranger would not be so forgiving if his feet were stepped on, and if Grace forgot her steps. The room was warm, and she was feeling quite overwhelmed by it all. I know. But it's not quite the same, is it? I know we've practised and you were very patient with me, but I can't remember any of the steps. Besides, I don't know who I'm going to dance with. Everyone's already paired off, Grace said, looking around her as couples arm in arm made their way into the throng of dancers already assembled. There was an air of expectation in the ballroom that evening. The first ball of the season was long anticipated. Grace's mother had first mentioned it on a gloomy afternoon in January, and now in the early summer flush of a June evening, it had arrived. They had talked of little else in the previous weeks, and it seemed everything, her whole life even, had been building to this moment. A debut is perhaps the most important moment in a young lady's life, that and her wedding day, her mother had said, and now those words rang through Grace's mind as she glanced around for a sight of her mother who was bound to be watching her with disappointment. Might I have this dance? A voice to her right said, and Grace turned to find an elderly man with grey hair and whiskers smiling at her. Oh, well, yes, she replied, hardly thinking what she was saying. He had taken her quite by surprise, and now he offered her his arm, even as Miriam made a face behind his back. My name's Crawley, Reginald Crawley, he said, as Grace took his arm and forced a smile onto her face. Ah, I'm delighted, thank you. Grace Villier, she stammered, wishing there was a way to extract herself from the awkwardness of what was about to become her first dance. Ah, yes, I know your father a little. He told me he had a daughter about to make her debut. I'm charmed to be the first to take you into the throng, he said. Grace had no choice but to smile and nod, as now he led her amongst the dancers. She thought about stepping on his toes deliberately to put him off. Other women, those on the arms of handsome young men, were looking at her with sympathetic disdain. Was she to be an object of pity from the beginning? Are you in a similar business to my father? Grace asked, remembering her mother's insistence on her making polite conversation with those who should show an interest in her. Not quite. I'm in sugar, mainly, he said. <laughs>
Grace shuddered. She knew what those in sugar dealt in. The trade of slaves across the Atlantic was abhorrent to her, and she was only glad her father was amongst a minority that agreed. As well as his estate, her father's business revolved around brandy imported from the continent, and those involved were paid a decent wage. Oh. The plantations? She asked. And he nodded. That's right. I've six plantations in the Caribbean and very productive they are too, he replied, smiling at her. The music had begun and he took her in his arms as they began to twirl in a waltz. Reginald himself was not a good dancer, and this allowed Grace to step on his toes without it appearing deliberate. I'm so sorry, she exclaimed as he winced. Quite all right, he stammered, grimacing as he spoke. Grace was relieved when the dance came to an end. The sight of it would appease her mother, even as she had no intention of repeating it again. She thanked Reginald, feigning breathlessness, and returning to Miriam, who was waiting for her at the edge of the dance floor. Well, do you and Sir Reginald have much in common? Miriam asked, and Grace rolled her eyes. If they're all like this, it's going to be a long evening, she replied with a sigh. Chapter Two The horses had slowed to a trot, and Henry Howard could hear voices coming from outside. I don't know why I bothered, he thought to himself as the door of the carriage compartment was opened. We're here now, my lord. Shall I help you out? The voice of Jones, Henry's valet, said. No, no, it's quite all right. Thank you, Jones. I'll manage. Henry replied, reaching out for the frame of the door and hauling himself up and out of the carriage. It was the night of the debutante ball at Denley House, and Henry had grudgingly accepted the invitation of the Duchess of Bridbury, whom he knew was only being kind in inviting him. Henry detested such events. They were always the same. The same people, the same music, the same refreshments, the same round of conversation. He sighed and smiled to himself. Anyone would think you were an old man. The way you go on, he thought to himself, shaking his head as he breathed in the scent of a dozen perfumes wafting on the air. The sounds of laughter and chatter surrounded him, and Jones now led him up the steps of Denley House, presenting his card to the Master of Ceremonies. He's going to announce you, my lord, the valet whispered. Yes, very good. The sooner I'm announced, the sooner I can find a place to sit for the evening. I'll enjoy the music, though there's never anything particularly new in the repertoire, Henry replied, lowering his voice so as not to be overheard speaking in disparaging tones. Music was amongst his chief pleasures in life. He could play the pianoforte by ear and had the rare gift of repetition, able to hear a piece of music and play it back without fault, and even with improvement. Lord Henry Howard! the Master of Ceremonies announced. This way, my lord, Jones said, and Henry stepped forward, following the valet into the ballroom. Music was playing, and Henry could hear the rustle of skirts and the tapping of feet. That same heady mixture of perfume hung in the air, mixed with the scent of lilies. The Duchess loved lilies. Ah, Lord Henry, how pleased we are to see you, a familiar voice said and Henry's hand was grasped by that of his hostess. Lady Bridbury, how glad I am to be here, Henry replied. He was lying, but it would please his hostess to hear it. Henry was something of a recluse. He rarely went out, though his valet kept him abreast of events going on in Sosity. He was something of a recluse, and it seemed most people in the district had largely forgotten the Duke of Crawshaw had a nephew. The beginning of the season was an important occasion. Henry had accepted the invitation on the basis he should be seen. The announcement of his inheritance was soon to be made, and it was certain to be the talk of the ton. I do so enjoy hosting the debutante ball. It's such a happy occasion. All these beautiful young ladies in their prime, budding roses waiting to burst forth with their scent, Lady Bridbury continued. Henry had to try hard to suppress a smile. It was not 
as budding roses, he would have described the women present at the balls, snatches of whose conversation he had overheard as he made his way through the throng. They were all of them cast from a similar mould, one which Henry could not help but despair over. I'm certain I'll find a husband this very night, Henry heard one of them say, and others had expressed a similar sentiment. The budding roses were expected to bloom, and woe betide any who did not. As for the men, they too were on display, as much a choice for the women as the women were for them. I'm sure it's going to be a delightful evening, Henry said, lying once again, and grateful when his hostess had concluded her small talk and exhorted him to the punch bowl. Shall I fetch a cup for you, my lord? Jones said, and Henry nodded. I'll sit where I normally sit, he replied, and the valet went off to fetch the punch, leaving Henry standing by the door. Lord Henry, I'm Reginald Crawley, how are you? A voice to Henry's left said, and his hand was suddenly seized in a firm grip. Ah, sir, Reginald, it's a pleasure, I'm sure. Henry replied, hoping his face did not display the grimace with which he had shuddered at the sound of the man's voice. Sir Reginald was a man whom Henry had always disliked, though he had met him on only a handful of occasions, and always in the midst of a gathering such as this. He delighted in boasting of his business interests, interests which largely involved human misery, and all for the sake of a sugar crop. I hope I find you well, Sir Reginald asked, still gripping Henry's hand in his. As well as can be expected, yes, thank you. I don't normally attend such events, but Lady Bridbury was kind enough to extend the invitation and I accepted, Henry replied. She's a very generous hostess. I've already danced with several of the young debutantes. I always like to be the first to mark a card, you know, Sir Reginald said, laughing at his own vulgarity. Henry did not find it funny. He knew just what men like Sir Reginald were capable of. He detested such men, lecherous rakes who would stop at nothing in pursuit of their own pleasures. I'm sure you do, Sir Reginald, Henry replied. He was relieved to hear the sound of his valet's voice as he returned with the punch, and Sir Reginald loosened Henry's hand from his own grip and wished him a pleasant evening. I'm sure you'll find your own debutante, he said. I doubt it, Henry whispered under his breath. Jones led him through the throng of dancers, but Henry was glad to go largely unnoticed. He kept to himself, living the life of a recluse, and only emerging in society when necessity demanded it. He preferred it that way, and was glad not to be accosted by anyone else who recognised him. But as they walked... Jones described the scene. He could always be relied on, and by the time they had made their progress across the ballroom, Henry could readily picture the scene. Anyone who was anyone, and a good number of those who, though they were someone, but were not, were present that evening. It was the beginning of another social season, an endless round of parties, balls, dinners and soirees. Intrigue and gossip would fuel the coming months, as young ladies from across the land descended on the capital with their parents or chaperones to taste for the first time the delights of the society into which they had been born, for good or ill. You could sit here, my lord. I'll bring you whatever you need, Jones said, helping Henry into a chair. The music was beginning to play, another waltz, one Henry had heard a dozen times and could hum the tune without accompaniment. Thank you, Jones. I'll sit here in glorious isolation until it's time to go home, Henry replied. I'm sure some of the guests will come to talk to you, my lord, the valet replied, but Henry shook his head. I hope they don't. I'll be quite happy here, he said, closing his eyes and allowing the music to wash over him. Despite having heard the pieces repeatedly, there was still something special about hearing them played in a setting such as this by a quartet of musicians. Henry smiled to himself 
the attention of Sir Reginald and Lady Bridbury was a small price to pay for the joy of music. Shall I wait outside, my lord? I can come back once the proceedings are over. Can I bring you anything? Jones asked, but Henry shook his head. No, Jones, thank you. Take some refreshment for yourself. I'll be quite all right here, I'm sure, Henry replied. He was happy on his own. It had always been so. He was used to it, inhabiting his own world and allowing his own thoughts to entertain him. Sitting in the gallery, he could hear the sound of the dancers below, the heels against the wooden floor, the swish of the dresses, the occasional startle of a stepped-on foot. He smiled and sat back, arching his fingers together and humming along to the tune. Just like it was when I was a child, he thought to himself, remembering the balls his parents would host at Lemington Grange, the home of his mother and father, close to the ancestral seat now occupied by his aunt and uncle. But such memories were distant now, and it had been a long time since Henry had set foot in the ancestral home. After the death of his parents in a carriage accident in which he himself was badly injured, it was his uncle who had taken responsibility for his welfare, first of all allowing him to live with him and his aunt, and then setting him up in a townhouse in Burnley. His uncle was a formidable figure, who no doubt would continue to hold the estate in an iron grip for many years to come. Henry was the heir, but he doubted the inheritance would be his for many years to come. Until then, he relied on his uncle's goodwill, living quietly with his valet and a small staff of servants. Not that I really want it, such responsibility, such a lot to think about, he said to himself, shaking his head. Henry was happiest when left alone. He liked to play the pianoforte, to be read to or to sit in the garden of his home in Burnley and listen to the birds singing and smell the scent of flowers on the air. It was a simple life, one which Henry had long since resigned himself to. He had no wish to be the Duke of Crawshaw, but such was to be his destiny, and when it came, Henry knew his life would change irreparably. The music had now ceased, and Henry could hear the musicians tuning their instruments as a lively chatter of conversation now rose from the dance floor below. Henry could hear a footfall on the stairs and voices close by. It's all right. Grace, just uh, sit down for a few moments. You'll soon feel quite well again, I'm sure, a voice was saying. Henry sighed. He had wanted some peace and quiet in the gallery, away from the rest of the throng, but now it seemed his peace was to be interrupted. Oh, it was horrible, Miriam. Quite horrible. I didn't think he was like that. Not at all. He seemed so charming at first. But I suppose all men are the same, another voice exclaimed, two women, speaking in louder whispers. Henry wondered what had happened. If Jones had been there, he could have asked him. But Henry was fiercely independent. He refused to live his life through the lens of a servant, albeit one as good and loyal as his valet. Excuse me, is everything all right? he asked, knowing he could not remain silent when chivalry surely demanded he speak, if only to show willing. The conversation between the two women paused. Lord Henry, isn't it? the first voice asked, and Henry nodded, fearing his intention to enjoy the music discreetly from the gallery would not come to fruition. Chapter 3 A few moments earlier Your mother won't accept anything less than three marks on your dance card, Miriam said, trying to chivy Grace along. They were hiding behind a pillar at the side of the ballroom, watching as Sir Reginald looked around aimlessly for Grace, to whom it appeared he had taken something of a shine. Is he gone yet? Grace asked not daring to peer around the side of the marble pillar for fear she should come face to face with her potential suitor. He's talking to someone now. It looks like he's asking him if he's seen you, Miriam replied. Grace groaned. Her mother had warned her about men such as Sir Reginald. A woman whose seasons slipped by without her finding a husband was in danger of becoming a maiden aunt, 
but for the opposite sex, the longevity of the seasons gave rise to a certain disposition which presented a danger to a young debutante. Sir Reginald was just such a man, elderly and with money. He considered the latter to be a form of entitlement, for what woman would refuse a man such as Sir Reginald? He's simply odious. The way he danced with me, pulling me into his embrace and talking to me of his odious business dealings. He'll follow me all night, won't he? Grace said, and Miriam nodded. I fear he will. It's one of the dangers of such gatherings. The younger men are put off by the older ones, whilst the young ladies would far rather the company of the former. We must hope something distracts him long enough for us to find you another partner. That, or I must sacrifice myself, Miriam replied. She said these final words in such a grand way. It seemed as though she really was about to martyr herself for some noble cause. Even as Grace knew she would swiftly rid herself of Sir Reginald at the first given opportunity. Would you really do that for me? Would you dance with him to save me from him? She asked, and Miriam nodded. If I have to, I will. But let's hope it won't come to that. Now there's a group of young men by the punch bowl, and one in particular I think could be your salvation, Miriam said. Grace took a chance, peering out from behind the pillar towards where her friend was pointing. Four young men, two in military uniform, stood drinking brandy and laughing heartily with one another. They were handsome and cut, dashing figures amongst the throng of ladies and gentlemen now gathering for the next dance. But how do I approach them? Grace asked. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Her mother had given her strict instructions in this matter. Don't, under any circumstances, approach a man and ask him to dance with you. It makes you look cheap and vulgar. A lady waits for her invitation, she had said. And Grace could see the look of disapproval on her face if she as much saw an approach on Grace's part. You wait for them to come to you, but we can place ourselves in an advantageous position. Come now, Grace, I'm rather thirsty, Miriam said, and seizing Grace by the arm, she marched her towards the punch bowl. In military strategy, there is great risk in crossing open ground. The way lies open to assault on every side, and to be spotted by the enemy risks certain death. But to Grace's relief, their advance across the ballroom did not draw the attentions of the enemy in the form of Sir Reginald. He was distracted by his current conversation, and Miriam and Grace reached the punch bowl without incident. The four men were still in raucous conversation, and Miriam edged towards them under the auspices of serving herself a glass of punch, indicating for Grace to do the same. I said to Harry Harper, it simply won't work. You don't have the money for it. You need capital to invest in these things, and a sum to fall back on if it goes wrong. He's taking a terrible risk, one of the men was saying. Grace was not entirely sure why Miriam had picked these four men as her intended, but as she stood with her back to them it seemed she was recognised. Ah, Lady Miriam, I thought I saw you amongst the throng, one of the men a tall gentleman, and one of the two, in military uniform, said. Miriam turned to the four men and smiled. Captain Walters, how nice to see you. And this is my friend, Lady Grace Villier, Miriam said, taking Grace's arm and pushing him forward so that she almost spilled her punch down her chest. How charming, Captain Walters replied, and he proceeded to introduce the others. The second man in military uniform was a Lieutenant Isaac Greaves, who was serving with Captain Walters in the regiment stationed at Burnley. They were joined by a man introduced as Sir Robert Cowper, and his friend and Member of Parliament for Hague, Simon Giles. Each of them expressed their delight in meeting Grace, and the conversation appeared to flow freely. This is your first season, Lady Grace, 
the Member of Parliament asked. He was a handsome man, somewhat older than Grace, but at only 18 years of age most men were older than she. He was perhaps 30 years old, with blonde hair and twinkling green eyes. His conversation was friendly, without being intrusive, and Grace was pleasantly surprised to find herself warming to him. That's right! The first ball of a new season, she replied, blushing a little under his gaze. Is that so? Tell me, is your dance card yet marked? he asked. Grace wished she could have answered without embarrassment, but she was forced to admit a mark had already been made. Ah, more's the pity, but I wonder if I might be the second, he asked, looking at her with a hopeful expression on his face. Grace was flattered, a handsome man of prominent position and good prospects. Her mother and father could not possibly object, and Simon's invitation was gratefully accepted. I'd be delighted, she said, glancing at Miriam, who gave her an encouraging nod. It turned out Captain Walters was a close friend of Miriam's cousin, and they had met at a ball the previous season. Their acquaintance had seen been renewed, and thus the two women entered the throng for the next dance together. Grace was delighted, if somewhat surprised. She had resigned herself to a miserable evening, and now it seemed she was to be rewarded for her patience. I must say, I was rather worried I was in for a dull evening. It was Marcus who persuaded me to come. I've been in London for the past few weeks whilst the house was sitting. There's always so much going on there. But I find the provinces somewhat dull at times, Simon said, slipping his hand around Grace's waist. It seemed an odd comment for a Member of Parliament to make about his own constituency, but Grace had often heard her father speak of their elected representatives as preferring the city to the countryside, and paying only lip service to the needs of the local population. I've never been to London, Grace replied as the dance began. Oh, I'm sure you'd enjoy it. Now you've made your debut, you simply have to go, Simon said, and Grace smiled. His grip on her was growing somewhat tighter, and as they twirled in the waltz he pulled her closer, gazing into her eyes and smiling. Do you... Go to London often? Grace asked, feeling suddenly somewhat uncomfortable in his arms. I try to. One can't possibly find enough distractions around here, he replied. He had appeared so charming at the moment of invitation, but now with his arms around her and his lips almost touching hers, Grace had the distinct impression he was about to take advantage of her. And don't you find distraction enough here? she asked, glancing around her for a means of escape. The music was getting faster, the other couples twirling in a mass of whirling skirts and clicking heels. There was no escape, and no sign of Miriam either. Not as often as I'd like, but I think I might have found it tonight, he whispered. His hand slid down her bodice and he leaned forward, his lips almost touching her cheek, his breath hot on her skin. Grace let out a cry, and without thinking what she was doing, she stamped hard on his foot. The Member of Parliament for Hague let out a yelp, though the sound of the music drowned it out to everyone but Grace, who, momentarily released from his grip, stepped backwards, knocking into another couple and apologising. Tears welled up in her eyes, and she shook her head as Simon cursed and scowled at her. You've no right, she exclaimed and she turned and pushed her way through the throng, emerging a moment later by the stairs. Grace, whatever's the matter? Miriam said, as she came, hurrying over. That awful man, he tried to take advantage of me. At least Sir Reginald didn't try to kiss me, Grace exclaimed as tears rolled down her cheeks. Oh, Grace, I'm so sorry. Miriam said, putting her arms around Grace, who would gladly have fled the ballroom there and then. She felt terrible. She had thought Simon to be a gentleman after the horrid manner in which Sir Reginald had treated her, but it seemed all men were the same. He thought he could do with me as he pleased. I feel terrible, Miriam, Grace exclaimed. I'm sorry, I thought a friend of Marcus would be a good and honourable sort. Let's go up to the gallery. I think we've had enough of the attentions of men for the evening, Miriam said, taking Grace by the hand.
Forever, I think, Grace replied. They made their way up the wide staircase to the gallery above. The last vestiges of the evening sunlight were streaming through the windows. Dusk was falling, and footmen were now lighting candles in sconces on the walls. A few of the other guests were sitting talking, and Miriam led Grace to chairs looking over the balcony rail to the dance floor below. It's all right, Grace, just sit down for a few moments. You'll soon feel quite well again, I'm sure, Miriam said. Oh, it was horrible, Miriam, quite horrible. I didn't think he was like that, not at all. He seemed so charming at first. But I suppose all men are the same, Miriam replied. She wondered what her mother would say if she was to recount what had happened. Would she even believe her? Excuse me, is everything all right? A voice from the shadows asked. Grace paused. It was a man's voice and now she turned to see a figure sitting in shadows. Lord Henry, isn't it? Miriam asked, and the man nodded. That's right, you'll no doubt think I'm hiding up here. You'd be right, he replied. Grace was wary. Was this to be yet another apparent gentleman who turned out to be a rake? I've not seen you since last season. Are you keeping well? Miriam asked. Grace watched as the man rose awkwardly to his feet, reaching out for the balcony rail to steady himself. She wondered if he was drunk, but to her surprise, Miriam rose to help him. I find these sorts of occasions difficult. My valet comes with me, of course, but one doesn't always want a servant following behind, he replied. You poor thing, it must be so difficult for you. But forgive me, I'm being terribly rude. Lord Henry, may I introduce my dear friend Lady Grace Villier? She's one of the debutantes here tonight, Miriam said. Lord Henry held out his hand, and now he had stepped into the light of the flickering candles. Grace could see a blankness in his eyes as he stared forwards towards an unknown point. It's a pleasure to meet you, she replied, taking his hand. Lavender, rose petals, a hint of cedarwood oil, he said, sniffing the air. Grace was again taken aback. His description was precisely that of the scent she was wearing, and she smiled and nodded. That's right. I was given the scent by my aunt for my birthday. It's a mixture of lavender, rose and cedarwood, she replied. Forgive me. My sense of smell is quite developed. It's what happens when one is blind, Henry replied. Grace was unsure what to say. She had never met a man who was blind beggars, wounded soldiers. She knew of the affliction well enough, but to meet a man of her own rank and class rather than an object of charity came as a surprise. Blind? Goodness! How sorry I am to hear that, she replied, studying Henry's face a little more closely. He was handsome, tall and lean, with cinnamon hair, a little older than she but it was his eyes which fascinated her. Wide and staring, expressionless, she could not take her own eyes off him. There was an accident. My parents were killed, a carriage upturned. I was lucky to survive, but the blindness was the price I paid for it, Henry replied. It's a tragic story. I've always felt so sorry for you, Lord Henry, though I've always admired your stoicism too. We met a few times last season, Miriam said. And you, Lady Miriam, were a panacea to the usual offerings of the ton. I don't really know why I've come here this evening. I like to hear the music, I suppose. When one is blind, music becomes a passion, he said. And I'm sure it must do. I play the pianoforte a little, and I couldn't imagine not having the pleasure of music in my life, Grace said. She felt terribly sorry for Lord Henry. He seemed a pleasant and friendly man whom life had served a devastating blow. Without music, life would surely be a mistake, he replied. Grace agreed entirely, and despite her reticence, she found herself warming to Lord Henry and interested to learn more about him. She had no intention of returning to the attentions of Sir Reginald or the Member of Parliament for Hague, and she and Miriam invited Lord Henry to sit with them. It would be our pleasure, Grace insisted. 
fetching another chair as Miriam led Lord Henry forward by the hand. Aren't you dancing? he asked. No, not after the awfulness of what we experienced earlier. I danced with two men, both of whom turned out to be rakes, Grace replied. Lord Henry smiled. But you do like to dance, he inquired. Grace nodded, though she had to keep reminding herself her new acquaintance could not see her gestures. I do, I think so, at least. I haven't really had much experience of it. Miriam and I have practised, and my mother would play the pianoforte and instruct me. She always told me it was the music which led the dance, not the man or the woman, Grace replied. She had not entirely understood her mother's words at the time, but now she had danced amidst the throng. They made a great deal more sense. Men liked to think they could lead. The ageing aristocrat and Simon certainly had. But in doing so, they asserted an unpleasant dominance over the woman with whom they were dancing, one which Grace found disturbing. Far better to be led by the music itself, so that the dance might be an expression of that music, rather than a subjection to the whims of another. What wise words those are. Your mother's right, Lady Grace. I myself could never lead, of course, but if the music allowed it, and my partner was sympathetic, he said, a smile coming over his lips. Have you ever danced? Grace asked, for she was curious as to Lord Henry's past and his intentions for the future. Our lives are dictated by the apparent social graces of society, Lady Grace. A man asks a woman to dance, he leads her and steps out. I can't even see to ask the lady, let alone lead her in the dance. But your mother's words give me hope, at least, he said. Grace found herself quite in awe of Lord Henry. He had overcome remarkable suffering in his life and bore an affliction most people never experience. She admired him greatly, not only for his stoicism, but for the manner in which he conducted himself. He had every quality about him, though it was clear he suffered deeply due to his blindness. The tittering women in the ballroom below would not give a second glance to such a man. They would gladly pander to the lascivious whims of the likes of Simon Giles, whilst ignoring any man they considered deficient. But Grace could not help but be attracted to this man who spoke so eloquently of music and had such a kind and gentle nature about him. Would you dance with me? she asked. Grace had not entirely thought through the implications of what she was asking, but in that moment she felt glad to be doing something to bring happiness to another. She had come to detest the evening at Denley House, with its rules and social expectations. She had no desire to dance again with any of the men below, but Lord Henry was different, and now he appeared flattered to have been asked. That's very kind of you, Lady Grace, he replied, holding out his hand to her. Grace took it, helping Henry to his feet and leading him along the balcony. She glanced back at Miriam, who smiled and nodded approvingly, even as she now wondered if the evening might not be so much of a disaster after all. Chapter Four You must tell me how to help you, Grace said, for she had never led a blind man before. You're doing very well. Just tell me when an obstacle presents itself, or when I'm about to take a tumble down the stairs. But I wonder, could you tell me what you see? he asked. They were at the top of the stairs, with a full view of the ballroom below. The musicians were tuning up their instruments for the next dance, and the guests were milling around the refreshment tables, the punch bowl having almost been drained. Certainly, well, there are dozens of guests. The women are wearing every shade of colour imaginable, whilst the men are in frock coats and white tie. It's a magnificent ballroom. I'd never been to Denley House before. Marble columns run along each side, supporting the gallery which extends to three sides. There are large windows above, though they're dark now, and the footmen are lighting candles everywhere. Our hostess, Lady Bridbury, is still doing her rounds of introduction, and I can see my mother and father talking to a rather pompous-looking man in the corner of the room, Grace replied. She thought she had done a satisfactory job of describing what she could see, but now Lord Henry smiled. Might I describe it to you? he asked, 
Grace was somewhat taken aback. She had told him what she could see. There was surely nothing else to add. Why, yes, please do, she replied, and he smiled. There's the scent of a dozen perfumes, a dozen colognes. I can distinguish them all. Lilies, roses, lavender, cedar wood, pine. Each scent tells its own story. The aristocratic lady bringing her daughter or granddaughter to her debut. The fearful young lady who oversents herself through nervousness. The man who applies a dab of scent on his collar, hoping it might allure and attract, Henry said. Grace was fascinated. She herself could smell nothing, her senses having dulled to the scents she had smelled on first entering the ballroom. And what else? Is it only scent you find yourself heightened to? She asked, curious to know more. Hearing to and taste. I've been listening to the conversations taking place below. Men eager to make their match, women whispering their uncertainties to their friends, mothers and grandmothers offering encouragement. What a cauldron of intrigues and possibilities an evening such as this can be. And then there's the music, Henry said, holding out his hand for Grace so that she might help him down the stairs. It's quite remarkable. The way your other senses seem to compensate for your loss of sight, Grace said, as she led Henry down the stairs. It's a strange thing, that's for certain. It's taken some getting used to, taste in particular, he replied. They had reached the bottom of the stairs and it seemed another dance was soon to begin. Grace noticed Sir Reginald out of the corner of her eye, but she paid him no attention and instead led Henry into the throng of the assembly. Are you all right? Just hold on to me. We'll let the music guide us. Don't worry about stepping on my feet. I'll lead if I have to, but I'm sure we'll manage she said. Henry nodded and smiled. I'm in your capable hands, Lady Grace, he replied, as now the music began. It was another waltz, one Grace recognised from the lessons her mother had given her in the weeks preceding the debutante ball. Together she and Henry danced, and it seemed entirely natural to be led by the music. Neither of them stepped on the other's toes and Grace found herself caught up in the delights of the moment, twirling and whirling across the dance floor as she and Henry danced. Isn't this wonderful? she exclaimed, feeling truly happy for the first time that evening. I'm so glad you asked me to dance, Lady Grace. Thank you. I was going to remain sitting in the gallery all evening. I'd happily have done so. What good fortune brought us together? Lord Henry said, and Grace smiled. It had been fortuitous, and Grace was only too happy for the dance to continue, even as she wondered what would come next. Miriam was pleased. She had felt terrible for having introduced Grace to Simon Giles, only for him to behave in such a wicked and rakish fashion. Miriam had every intention of telling Captain Walters just what she thought of his friends. But her eyes were fixed on Grace and Henry and now she descended from the gallery watching from the stairs as the two of them danced. She and Lord Henry had become acquainted the previous summer at a ball held by the Marquis of Clinton. She had been introduced to him and had learned the sad story of his having lost his sight in the carriage accident, which had killed his parents. It was a tragic story and Miriam had felt terribly sorry for him. Seeing him again had reminded her of what pleasant company he had been and she was glad Grace had made his acquaintance. Miriam, who's Grace dancing with? A voice to Miriam's left said, and Miriam turned to find Grace's mother, the Countess of Dilbury, looking at her inquiringly. Miriam had a healthy respect for Grace's mother. She was a formidable figure, but had Grace's best interests at heart. She could be stern, but also kind, and she wanted nothing less than to see her daughter married to the right sort of man. An aristocrat of good standing and good fortune. In this way, she was no different to so many other women present at the debutante ball that evening. And Miriam wanted only to encourage Grace in the surprising match she appeared to be making with Lord Henry. But she was also aware of the danger 
Lord Henry was blind, and Miriam was not certain how Grace's mother would react to the news of her daughter dancing with a man whose prospects were hampered by his physical limitations. In that moment, Miriam decided not to tell the whole truth, even as knew it could not remain untold forever. Henry Howard, my lady, Miriam replied, hoping Grace's mother was not already aware of the aristocrat with whom her daughter was dancing and clearly delighting in the company of. The Countess looked at her questioningly. Who are his family? she asked. Miriam felt relieved to be able to answer in terms the Countess would approve of. Henry was the nephew of the Duke of Crawshaw, and there was no doubting Henry's suitability for the Countess's daughter. The Crawshaw line, my lady? Henry's the nephew of the Duke, next in line, she replied, and Grace's mother nodded approvingly. Oh, is that so? How marvellous, she exclaimed, peering across the dance floor at Miriam and Henry, who were twirling in a most convincing waltz. To watch them, one would never think Henry to be blind. Grace was leading, to an extent, but they moved with such poise and grace as befitted her name that Miriam was quite captivated by the sight. They do look good together, my lady, Miriam ventured, and the Countess nodded. They certainly do. I must make further inquiries of the gentleman in question. I was beginning to despair of Grace's prospects, but they seem to be looking up, don't you think? She said. Miriam had not doubted Grace's prospects. Her friend was a delight, and in Miriam's mind, she would make the perfect match for any gentleman, so long as he was the perfect match for her. I'm sure Grace knows what she's doing, Miriam replied. The Countess raised her eyebrows. I'm not entirely convinced she does, Miriam. You display a charity I myself do not possess when it comes to Grace's prospects. Nevertheless, I'm grateful to you for your friendship and example to her. But what of your own prospects? Grace's mother asked. Miriam blushed. Her own prospects were mixed, but she had admirers, and as the daughter of a baron, she felt certain she would one day find the right match for her. There are one or two possibilities. It's only my second season, after all. I'm glad to see Grace flourishing. We've always been the closest of friends, she replied. The Countess smiled, turning her attention back to Grace and Henry. The waltz came to an end, and now Henry bowed to Grace, who curtsied in return. I'm glad to see she's enjoying herself at least, the Countess said. Miriam was relieved she did not go to meet Grace as she and Henry walked arm in arm to chairs at the side of the ballroom. To the casual observer, it appeared as though they were walking affectionately together. Even as Miriam knew, Grace was guiding Henry to his place. I'll act as chaperone, Miriam said, glad of a reason to excuse herself. She hurried over to Grace and Henry, smiling at her friend, who looked flushed but happy. Did you see us? Wasn't it marvellous? Grace exclaimed, and Miriam nodded. I was just talking to your mother, Miriam replied. Grace's face fell. Didn't she approve? She never approves of anything I do, Grace exclaimed. Miriam smiled and shook her head. No, she was quite delighted at the sight of the two of you dancing together, Miriam replied. Henry laughed. Does she know I'm blind? he asked, raising his eyebrows. Miriam felt embarrassed. She had not told the Countess of Henry's affliction for precisely the reason Grace had suggested. The Countess would disapprove. She would pass judgment on Henry, even without knowing anything more of him. The blind were to be pitied, not married, and any suggestion to the contrary would be met with indignation. Well, she didn't ask, Miriam replied, fearing she might ruin Grace's chance of finding happiness. Henry smiled and shook his head. She'll know soon enough the blind man dancing with her daughter. Imagine the scandal, he said, and Grace laughed. There's no scandal in it. Why shouldn't we dance together? I'm glad we have, she said, taking Henry's hand in hers and smiling. Miriam was pleased. Secretly, she had not expected Grace to have success at her coming out. She was shy and retiring, 
and whilst she was a delight to be with once one got to know her, it was getting to know her which was the problem. Grace preferred her own company. She was musical and bookish, and would gladly spend her days alone reading, painting and sewing. She had few friends, and she was happy in that fact. Courtship was not something she was seeking, even as her moment of debut demanded it. And I'm glad we have two, Lady Grace. I wonder, would it be awfully impertinent of me to suggest I call on you tomorrow? Or the following day? Lord Henry asked. Miriam held her breath, glancing at Grace, who appeared suddenly shy, as though she had not expected to be asked such a question by a man she so clearly found attractive. I... well, yes, I'd like that very much, she replied, and Miriam breathed a sigh of relief. She had feared her friend would say no, thus spoiling her chances of every finding a man to marry and embarrassing a good soul in the process. For Lord Henry was a good soul, and one whom Miriam had every confidence would prove himself a worthy courtship. But despite her happiness at this budding union, Miriam feared it could so easily be snatched away as soon as the Countess discovered the truth about Henry. Only time will tell, Miriam thought to herself, as the music struck up once again and Grace and Henry stepped back into the throng. Chapter 5 Dilbury Park, Lancashire, England Aren't they beautiful, Grace? How thoughtful of him to send flowers, Miriam said, as Grace showed her friend the bouquet of flowers sent to her by Henry the day after the debutante ball. The rest of the evening had passed happily. Grace and Henry had danced three more times before the ball had ended, and he had promised to call on Grace the following day. The flowers had arrived after breakfast and were signed with an X and a scrawled H. Grace had known at once who they were from, and now she had displayed them in her sitting room, where she had wished to show them to Miriam immediately after her friend's arrival that afternoon. Isn't it? He was charming. And such a contrast to those awful men who danced with me beforehand. My mother wanted me to speak to Sir Reginald again. But I was having none of it. I told her I'd met a man named Henry, Lord Henry. Henry, and that I didn't need to talk to some awful man who made his money from the sugar plantations, Grace replied. Miriam laughed, and Grace poured them both a cup of tea from a china pot the maid had just brought in, along with a tray of dainty cakes and savouries. It was a beautiful day, and since Grace's sitting room opened out onto the terrace, they took their tea outside, looking over the lawns of Dilbury Park, the ancestral seat of Grace's father. He's a most charming man. He's poor, of course. The lot of the nephew without hope of immediate inheritance, Miriam said. Grace smiled. I don't want to rush into anything, but it does feel as though it's the right thing, doesn't it? She replied. Her first thought that morning had been of Henry, and whilst she was all too aware of the dangers of infatuation, there was no doubting her attraction to him. After a while, she had entirely forgotten his blindness. It was as though it made no difference to any future possibility. He could not see her, but in every other way he sensed her fully, more so than most men. He seemed to have a particular way about him and was able to discern those things others missed. He noticed details, and Grace had been struck by his attentiveness towards her. A debutante is allowed to make mistakes, Grace but she might also find herself with the luck of the draw. It's not unheard of for a woman to meet the man she's destined to marry on the very night of her debut, Miriam replied. Grace knew she should not allow the possibility to get the better of her. She liked Henry, and the arrival of the flowers that morning had suggested a mutual attraction. They were fragrant and filled the sitting room with a sweet perfume, such that Henry himself might describe with detail. Scent, too, wafted up from the garden, and with the sun warm on her face, Grace could not help but feel life was somehow far better than it had seemed the previous day, when the prospect of the unknown had loomed large before her. I don't know about that. But I do know I like him, Miriam. Do you think my parents would permit a courtship? 
I didn't mention the fact of Henry's blindness to them as we rode in the carriage last night. But they seemed very taken by the idea of him, Grace said. She was uncertain what her mother would say when she discovered Henry's affliction. She could not deny the qualities of aristocracy and prospect, but blindness would not be something the Countess would easily accept. She would ask all manner of questions and worry as to Grace's future prospects. He has many estimable qualities, more than most men, in fact. He just happens to be blind, that's all. Miriam replied. It was, Grace knew, as her friend intimated, just a matter of fact. Some men were tall, others were short, some had brown hair, others blonde. Some men could see, others could not. Admittedly, the affliction of blindness was a more drastic consideration than a man's hair colour, but it was simply a fact as to who Henry was, rather than a reason to reject him. He had proved himself a gentleman in every way, and if her mother and father could only see this for themselves, they would be bound to accept the possibility of courtship. You're right, Miriam. He's going to call here tomorrow. I presume he'll bring his valet. They'll realise my mother and father. I mean, as soon as they meet him. They can't possibly say anything to his face. And if they've got a problem with it, they can take it up with me, Grace replied. She was adamant she would not allow her parents to spoil this chance she had at happiness. It had come about quite suddenly and out of the blue. She had gone to the debutante ball with low expectations, and those expectations had been realised in Sir Reginald and Simon Giles. But Lord Henry was different, and Grace was only too glad to think she made such an impression on him. I'm sure it's going to be quite all right, Grace. You'll see. Now I really must go and chivy my mother along. She would sit all afternoon taking tea, but we simply must get to the haberdashery before it closes, Miriam said, rising to her feet. Grace's mother was taking tea with Miriam's mother and several other ladies in the drawing room, and the two of them walked arm in arm along the terrace to where the open doors of the drawing room allowed the conversation of the group of women to drift out on the air. No, he's certainly blind. I've seen it for myself, if you'll pardon my turn of phrase, one of the women was saying. Grace paused, glancing at Miriam, the two women holding back, hidden from view of the drawing room window by the large ivy growing up the side of the house. Blind? But he didn't look blind? I suppose one doesn't look blind. I really don't know anything about him. Grace was full of him, and he sent her a bouquet of flowers this morning. I thought it all sounded too good to be true. I can't possibly let her court a blind man. What would people say? Grace's mother replied. Grace took a deep breath, her anger growing as she listened to her mother's uncharitable remarks. She'd be the talk of the ton, and for all the wrong reasons, he was blinded in a carriage accident. It was some years ago now. It killed his parents, though his uncle was inheritor of the dukedom. The woman who'd first spoken now continued. And what of his title? Is he at least a rich blind man? She asked. And the other women, including Miriam's mother, laughed. Well, he's to inherit. But the Duke remains in rude health. He's not going anywhere soon, and in the meanwhile... Lord Henry has very little to call his own. But imagine it. Whoever heard of a blind duke? The woman replied. I can't bear to listen to this, Grace exclaimed, even as she could not tear herself away. This wicked woman was discrediting Henry at every turn. And Grace's mother was taking everything she said as truth. You're right, Arabella, I can't allow it. We can't allow it. I'll tell the Earl at once. Lord Henry plans to call on Grace tomorrow. We'll put him off. It can't be allowed, Grace's mother said, and a murmur of agreement went up from her companions. You're doing the right thing, Camilla. Why not push for a match with Sir Reginald Crawley, 
He has every quality a young lady could desire, the woman continued. Grace shuddered. Sir Reginald had none of the qualities she desired. He lacked every quality Henry possessed, and she was not about to find herself manoeuvred into a marriage she did not desire, and which would only make her miserable. It's such a trial, isn't it? Having only one daughter makes things infinitely more difficult. One has to get it just right. It's a constant worry. I was pleased to see her dancing with Lord Henry last night, but now I know of his affliction, see, Grace's mother said. Grace stepped forward. She was about to confront her mother, but Miriam held her back. Don't listen to them, Grace. We'll find a way. It won't be easy, but we'll convince them. I promise, Miriam whispered. Grace was surprised at the force of feeling by which she desired to defend Lord Henry from the insults of the women gathered in the drawing room. She felt a bitter sense of injustice listening to their cruel words and vicious snipes. They spoke as though it were a scandal to be blind rather than a tragic accident. And she wondered how they themselves would feel about suffering such an affliction or seeing a loved one lose their sight. I can just imagine what my father's going to say when he learns of it, Grace said. Her father was a man of strict principles and a traditionalist. He would not be happy to learn of Henry's impediment. He would want to know his daughter would be taken care of and provided for. But not only was Henry blind, his hopes of succession were also dubious. If he did not inherit, he would be a blind and penniless orphan, living on the charity of whichever distant relative should be given the estate and title which rightfully belonged to him. And even if he did inherit, he would still fall short of the ideal which Grace's parents had in mind. Don't think about it, Grace, Miriam said. But Grace could not help but think about it, and after bidding Miriam goodbye, she returned to the drawing room, breathing in the scent of the flowers Henry had sent her, and wondering why love could not be as simple as the stories in books she read. Chapter 6 no, Grace, absolutely not. It simply couldn't work. You'll thank me for this in years to come, I assure you, Grace's mother said. The matter of Lord Henry and his affliction had been raised at dinner that evening, and Grace was in the midst of an argument with her parents over her newfound suitor's suitability. She was angry at the comments she had overheard that afternoon in the drawing room, and was determined to make a case for the feelings which had blossomed in the short time she'd known the troubled aristocrat. But why does it matter? It's no scandal to be blind. No more than. It's a scandal to be bald or deaf. Better a blind man than a rakish fool like Sir Reginald, Grace exclaimed, pushing away her half-eaten plate of food and scowling at her mother who looked at her in horror. Sir Reginald is a very respectable man, Grace. You'd do well to remember that, she exclaimed. He's a hideous man who makes money out of other people's misery. His use is slaves on his plantations, mother. Don't you find that abhorrent? She asked, glancing at her father for support. The Earl sighed. Dinner that evening at Dilbury Park was not going to be a quiet affair. Whilst I don't condone Sir Reginald's business practices, I do take issue with a blind, penniless aristocrat as a suitor for my daughter, he replied. There, listen to your father, Grace. He speaks the truth. You can't entertain such fanciful ideas. Do you hear me? I'm sure you enjoyed your dance together, but that's as far as it goes. I won't hear of any more. Do you understand me? Of all the men you could have danced with last night at the ball, you had to choose him, didn't you? Grace's mother snapped. Grace did not understand the nature of their prejudice. It was hardly Henry's fault he was blind, and she rolled her eyes and fixed her mother with an angry stare. Is it his blindness or the question over his inheritance which bothers you the most, mother? She asked. Her mother was silent for a moment and now she sighed and reached across the table to take Grace's hand in hers. Your father and I want what's best for you, Grace. You've no brother. And when you dear father and I pass from this world, we want to know you'll be taken care of. It would be irresponsible of us to allow a match in which you found yourself destitute. 
A man of title doesn't mean a man of good fortune. Never forget that, she said. The Countess was fond of such platitudes. She had a saying for most any situation, and this one brought tears to Grace's eyes. She felt almost embarrassed as to the force of her feelings, but this was an injustice, and one she had not thought her parents capable of. They had their eccentricities, but she had not believed they could be prejudiced in such a way as this. But surely it would be irresponsible of you to allow a match in which I wasn't happy, Grace retorted. Her parents looked at one another. Her mother shook her head. Happiness and stability are two different things, Grace. We wouldn't allow you to marry a pauper, for just the same reason. It's not because Lord Henry's blind. It's the circumstances of his inheritance that worry us, the Countess said. Grace pouted her lips and glared at her mother. She was only making excuses. It was because Henry was blind. There was nothing else to it. Her mother did not want to live with the shame of explanation and knowing other women were laughing behind her back in the salons and at fashionable gatherings. Her daughter's courting the blind man. Imagine if they marry. Blind children, like blind mice, they would say. Grace may have been a debutante, but she knew the ways of the ton well enough. Those of Grace's rank and class were fickle. They liked to see and to be seen, and if something was not as they expected to see it, they would gossip and whisper about it until another scandal should catch their attention. So I can't even receive him tomorrow? Is that what you're saying? Grace demanded. Once again, her parents looked at one another. I think we'll put him off, Grace. Your mother's right, it's not appropriate, her father replied. They were both against her now, and Grace stomped her foot angrily. I won't marry anyone you suggest. I certainly won't entertain the thought of marrying Sir Reginald. He's ghastly. I hate him and all the rest, Grace exclaimed. Her mother fixed her with an angry stare. A swallow doesn't make a summer, Grace and a single gentleman doesn't make a season. You're a debutante. You dance with a couple of men at your first ball and believe you've fallen in love. It's not how these things work. Do you understand me? You know nothing about it. It's up to a girl's mother to guide her along such a path, the Countess said. Grace did not like being referred to as a girl, and she did not care if her mother was upset or not. She would make her own choices, and if she wanted to receive Lord Henry the following day, she would do so. I don't care what you say, I'm seeing him tomorrow, Grace replied, even as she knew she was fighting a losing battle. But now it was her father who interjected, and his words were cruel and heartless. Well, there's one certainty, Grace, he won't be seeing you quite literally, he said, and her mother nodded. Yes, and you won't be seeing him. You're to remain in this house, Grace. I'm going to cancel tea with Lady Honoria tomorrow. You can stay in your bedroom and put this silly business behind you, she said, fixing Grace with a pointed look. Her mother had never forbidden her from going out like this, and Grace stared at her incredulously. You're telling me I can't go out, she demanded, and her mother nodded. That's precisely what I'm telling you, Grace. Now go upstairs and stay there, she said, pointing to the drawing room door. Grace did not reply, and turning on her heels, she marched out of the room, slamming the door behind her with such force it seemed the whole house shook. I'll show them, she said to herself, angry at being told who she could and could not see, and astonished at the way in which her parents had behaved. Grace could see beyond Henry's affliction. In her eyes it was no affliction at all. It was part of who he was and she liked him all the more for it, the way in which he had described the ballroom, the effortless manner in which they had danced, taken up by the music and the flowers chosen for their scent. Henry was not like those other men, and for that Grace could only be thankful, even as she vowed not to allow her mother and father to dictate whom she was to fall in love with. Chapter 7 Cufflinks, my lord, Joan said and Henry held out his arms for the valet to attach the sleeves of his shirt together. The gold ones, Jones, not the silver, Henry replied, 
He could tell which pair of cufflinks his valet had chosen by the force with which Jones pushed them through the buttonholes. The silver ones were rounded, but the gold ones were square and fiddlier to attach. It was little details such as this which Henry noticed, and his valet laughed. You notice every detail, my lord. You're quite remarkable, if I might say so, he said, as he attached the gold cufflinks to Henry's shirt sleeves. You're too kind, Jones. I couldn't do it without you. How terrible it must be for those similarly afflicted who lack the help I receive from you, Henry replied. I'm simply glad to be of assistance, my lord. Will you wear your red frock coat or the dark blue? Jones asked. Henry was meticulous in his dress. He was always well presented and took pride in his appearance, even as he himself could not see it. The dark blue and make sure it's brushed, Jones, Henry said. Very good, my lord, the valet replied. Henry was particularly eager to look his best that day. He was due to call on Lady Grace, and he hoped the flowers he had sent the previous day had been met with gratitude. Henry had not expected to dance with one of the debutantes at the Bridbury Ball. He had gone there reluctantly, feeling somewhat foolish and out of place. A blind man attending a ball, who ever heard of such a thing? but the pleasant surprise of his encounter with Lady Grace. Dilbury had brought with it an unexpected possibility. Henry had all but given up on the possibility of romance. There were women who had thought a blind man to be an interesting distraction, but their attraction had so often been a matter of charity rather than genuine desire. And when they had discovered the complications of his inheritance, their interest had faded. Henry was used to disappointment, and if he had a fault, it was enthusiasm. He could so easily be taken in a whirlwind of romance and believe the woman who had shown him even a modicum of interest was the one whom he would marry. Such misplaced enthusiasm had been his downfall on several occasions, leaving him, if not with a broken heart, at least a bruised one. Henry was naturally cautious, but his feelings as to the memory of his encounter with Grace were entirely hopeful. She had been different to so many others, not treating him as an oddity or eccentricity, but with genuine interest. How do I look, Jones? Henry asked, as the valet sprayed him with cologne. Like the finest of gentlemen, sir, Jones replied. Henry smiled. It did not matter he could not see his own reflection. What mattered was to know he looked his best, and he trusted his valet to have made sure he did. Very good. Will you take me down, Jones? I'll have breakfast in the dining room. You can read the periodicals to me if you would, Henry said. Routine was important to Henry. He relied on his valet to wake him at certain times and ensure meals were served in a timely fashion. Each morning, Jones read to him from the day's periodicals before proceeding to address Henry's correspondence. He lived as independently as he could, in a townhouse in Burnley not far from his uncle's estate. Very good, my lord. Take my arm, if you will, Jones said. Henry reached out, taking the valet's arm and allowing him to be led from his bedchamber and down the stairs. Sunlight was flooding in from the window halfway down the stairs. Henry could feel its warmth on his face. And now the pleasant scent of breakfast wafted through the hallways. Jones led Henry into the dining room where he sat down, reaching out to check the cutlery was all in its place. I'm missing a teaspoon, Jones, and a glass, Henry said. He knew precisely the order the table should be laid in, and now the valet placed the item of cutlery and the glass in their place. Shall I read to you from the gentleman's magazine, my lord? Jones asked. Parliamentary debates, political intrigues, the latest scandal to beset the regent. I'm sure it'll make for excellent digestion, Henry said, as a maid placed his breakfast before him. It smelled like kedgery, and Henry pushed it away. Is anything wrong, my lord? Jones asked. I thought I smelled sausages earlier. I'm not sure kedgery will quite agree with me this morning. I don't want to feel unwell on my important errand. Forgive me, could I have something else? 
Henry said, directing his voice towards the maid, Shirley, whom he presumed to be standing by the sideboard. Yes, my lord, she said. The plate was removed, and a few moments later, sausages replaced the unwanted dish of rice, eggs and fish. Jones sat down on a chair at the side of the room, and Henry began to eat as the rustle of papers indicated the reading of the gentleman's magazine was about to begin. The island of Corsica, now happily united to the crown of Great Britain, is situated nearly opposite to the mainland of Genoa, between the Gulf of Genoa and the land of Sardinia. Jones began to read, but Henry found his attentions distracted. He was thinking of Grace, attempting to picture her in his mind's eye. He had wanted to touch her face at the ball, though it had seemed an imposition to ask such a thing of a young lady. Touch was the means by which Henry gained a picture of a person. He would place his hands on their cheeks and allow his mind's eye to create an image of them as he ran his hands over their face. I hope she'll see me today, he thought to himself, for the sending of the flowers had been but a precursor to his intentions now. He was going to call on Grace that very morning and paying little attention to the valet's continued description of the island of Corsica, Henry hurriedly finished his breakfast. Shall I continue, my lord? Jones asked as Henry set down his knife and fork. No, I think I've heard enough. We should leave shortly, Jones, Henry replied, rising to his feet and tossing his napkin aside. He was impatient, his mind filled with the possibility of what was to come. Never before had he been so caught up in the pleasures of a new attraction, for whilst Henry could not see Grace, he knew he was attracted to her. Her kind words, her effortless conversation, the way in which they had danced, and the simple ease of her company had led Henry to think of little else but their next meeting. Very good, my lord. Will you not see to your correspondence first? the valet asked. Henry smiled and shook his head. Dull letters from dull people, invitations to dull events, or demands for money. That's all my correspondence ever consists of. No, have the carriage prepared. We leave at once for Dilbury Park, Henry replied. The home of Grace's parents, the Earl and Countess of Dilbury, lay some distance to the west of the county. It would take a morning's ride to reach there, but Henry was enthusiastic, and he hoped the reward for his efforts might be considerable. He was not acquainted with the Earl and Countess, having kept himself to himself these years gone by since the accident which had killed his parents and left him blinded. Am I to accompany you, my lord? Jones asked as he helped Henry into the carriage compartment a short while later. Yes, certainly. I couldn't do without you, Jones. It's rare for me to go anywhere these days. No, no, I need you at my side. Though if all goes well with Lady Grace, perhaps you might step out of the room. I'm sure she'll be chaperoned, but I'd prefer to express my feelings for her as privately as possible, Henry said. Jones was a friend and confidant. He had been Henry's loyal servant these long years gone by, but in matters of romance, Henry did not wish his all-seeing valet to be privy to every emotional whim and turmoil. Very good, my lord. We'll leave now, Jones replied. The carriage set off, leaving Burnley behind. Jones described to countryside they were passing through, the rolling moorland, with its deep valleys and gushing streams, the vast swathes of woodland, and the open views stretching as far as the sea in the distance. Henry could picture it. He had not been born blind, and his imagination was vivid even as he feared his memories may one day fade. As it was, Henry tried always to maintain his mind's eye, to keep it active and alert. He could see so much, imagine so much, experience so much through it, even if the actual vision eluded him. What was she like, Lady Grace, I mean? What was your impression of her? Henry asked. Well, my lord, it's not for me to say. She was certainly very pretty. Strawberry blonde hair, freckles, deep, dark green eyes. A fragile figure, Jones replied. Henry tried to summon the image in his mind, but it was not Grace's appearance he pictured, confused as it seemed. But what she represented that seemed to matter the most. She had accepted him for who he was, not a blind man, 
but a man who happened to be blind and was so much more than his affliction made him out to be. Not her looks, but who she is, Henry replied, pushing the valet for a more intimate reply. Joan seemed embarrassed. Well, my lord, she was... She seemed delightful. Forgive me for saying this, but so many previous women have looked on you with a sympathetic air. But Lady Grace was different. I watched her. She hardly seemed to notice your affliction. She was merely delighting in your company. I was glad to see it, Jones replied. Henry smiled. It was the same impression he himself had received, and he was glad to hear his valet repeat the thoughts in his mind. He had hoped it was the case, for he could not bear to be treated merely as an object of pity or an amusing distraction. You're right, Jones. I think so many women don't quite know what to make of me. It doesn't help that I'm penniless, either. They all assume, if they even know about me, I'll not inherit. My aunt may yet give birth to a son, Henry replied. His circumstances were precarious. Henry was the heir to the dukedom, but until his inheritance was secured, his financial situation was dire by aristocratic standards. He maintained his household on a modest income, but was hardly in the league of gentlemen who could boast 10,000 a year. I'm sure not every woman considers such matters, my lord, Jones replied. But every woman's father does. Henry replied. If blindness was not a barrier to marriage, then a lack of wealth surely was. No father would allow his daughter to marry a man without prospects, and Henry thus faced a battle on two fronts. They rode in silence for a while, Henry listening to the rhythmic clitter-clatter of the carriage wheels and imagining what he would say on reaching Dilbury Park. I do hope she's expecting me, he thought to himself even as he imagined the possibility of rejection or even outright humiliation. But the risk was worth it, and Henry did not believe Lady Grace Dilbury was anything like the other women he had previously encountered. A week? I can't stay in here a week, Grace exclaimed as her mother raised her eyebrows and tutted. You will, Grace. I don't want to hear any more nonsense about this blind nobleman her mother replied. Grace was livid. Her parents were being entirely unreasonable. She thought about running away, that would show them. But what about the season? Aren't there balls to go to, dinners to attend? You can't keep me from all of that, surely, Grace said. It was not that she wanted to attend these events, the thought of them made her cringe. But to be confined to her chambers for the simple act of dancing with a man whom her parents did not approve of was a pure injustice. You've made a bad start to your first season, Grace. I don't see what was wrong with Sir Reginald, but you burned your bridges there and with the Member of Parliament. Word gets around, Grace, and when several men speak of you disparagingly, her mother began even as Grace interrupted her, I don't care if those awful men speak disparagingly of me. I'll speak disparagingly of them, too. They're nothing but wicked rakes. Why is it you forbid me from seeing the one decent man I met in the whole course of the evening? Just because he's blind, Grace replied, but her mother cut her short. It's not because he's blind, it's because he's penniless. We know nothing about him, Grace. His parents are dead. His uncle controls the estate. I made inquiries. He has nothing to recommend him, she replied. He has everything to recommend him. I think he's wonderful, charming, considerate, kind, gentle. I could go on. But no, you want me to marry a rake as long as he has a large pocketbook, Grace replied. Her mother grimaced, but she would not back down, and a stalemate now ensued. Grace was told to remain in her bedchamber for the coming week. There would be no balls, no soirees, no dinners, no participation in the season. She was to rid herself of foolish notions surrounding Henry and think instead of repairing the damage she had done in her rudeness to Sir Reginald and Simon Giles. The door was shut and the key turned in the lock. 
I just don't understand it, Grace thought to herself. She sat down to compose a letter to Miriam, lamenting her sorry situation and begging her friend to visit her at her earliest convenience. Her mother had not forbidden the company of female friends and Grace was to dine with her parents each evening. But she was not to leave the house and she was to spend her days confined to her bedchamber. It seemed a ridiculous punishment for something which could hardly be considered a crime. But Grace knew the store by which her mother set this debut. She had wanted it to be perfect, and this was her way of reasserting her authority over the procedures. I doubt I'll ever see Henry again, Grace thought to herself, for she had been forbidden from responding with gratitude for the flowers, and she could only believe he would think her terribly rude and uninterested. It was a sorry state of affairs, and as she signed off her letter, Grace sighed, saddened as to her prospects which once again appeared bleak. It's quite a remarkable setting, my lord, Jones said. He was describing the view of Dilbury Park as they approached along a sweeping drive lined with mature trees. And the house itself, Henry asked, for he was keen to know the sort of place he was coming to. A fine mansion, my lord, a central block in the neoclassical style, a portico with columns and two wings on either side, with a forecourt to the front and a fountain. The gardens are quite mature and stretch out on every side. I can see a walled garden and orchard in the distance. A beautiful setting, the valet replied. Henry could conjure an approximate image in his mind, but this was his first visit to Dilbury Park and he really knew nothing of the place or people he was going to meet. The Earl was well known in the county, a philanthropist with business interests in the South and abroad. The Countess was known for her social gatherings, and there was much talk of the annual ball held at Dilbury Park to mark the beginning of the Christmas season. It sounds a delightful place, Jones, Henry replied, as the carriage now came to a halt. Shall I announce you, my lord? Jones asked, but Henry shook his head. He wanted to present himself to Grace's parents in the hope of securing an audience with Grace herself. First impressions mattered, and whilst Henry knew he faced an uphill struggle, he hoped he would make the right one. Just help me up the steps, Jones. Knock for me and make the introductions to whichever servant answers, presumably the butler, Henry replied. Jones opened the carriage compartment door and helped Henry out onto the forecourt. The scent of lavender wafted on the air, and in the distance Henry could hear the sound of horses' hooves clippity-clopping, perhaps around a stable yard. This way, my lord, Jones said, and Henry took his valet's arm and allowed himself to be led up the steps towards the house. What can I see? Henry asked for there was always a sense of uncertainty in a new and unfamiliar place. A large door, painted red, with a golden knocker in the shape of a lion's head. I'll knock, my lord, Jones said, and the sound of the knocker echoed across the forecourt. Henry was feeling nervous. This was the moment of truth. The moment he had been waiting for. He had thought about what he would say a hundred times, even as he hoped the conversation would not be awkward or difficult. He hoped to make a good impression on Grace's parents and then speak to her alone, or with a chaperone. He wanted to thank her for her kindness at the ball, and for treating him, not as an object of pity, but as a friend with whom something more might now blossom. Footsteps could be heard from inside, and now the door creaked open. Can I help you? An imperious sounding voice asked. This was presumably the butler, and before Jones could reply on Henry's behalf, Henry himself gave an answer. Yes, I'm expected, I believe. Lord Henry Howard, I'm here to see Lady Grace and her parents, Henry replied. There was a pause. Henry could picture the butler. All butlers were the same, tall, thin, with hooked noses and bushy eyebrows, their expressions fixed in a permanent scowl. I wasn't aware of the invitation. One moment, came the reply. The door was closed. It seemed odd to Henry to be treated in such a manner. Grace had surely told her parents to expect him, 
and he had expected more than just a curt reception, as though he was a tinker selling lace or an old woman reading palms for silver. Well, we're here at least, Henry said. He was a stern-looking man, my lord. He looked us up and down with the most disdainful expression on his face, Jones said. Well, let him do so. He's only a servant. I didn't mean it like that, Jones, I'm sorry, Henry replied. But the valet only laughed. Butlers are all the same, my lord, he replied. They were kept waiting for several moments, and despite the pleasantness of the sunshine on the steps, Henry was growing impatient. I don't see what the trouble is. He might at least have invited us into the hallway, Henry said, just as footsteps approached. The door was opened and Henry waited expectantly. He had hoped it might have been Grace coming to meet him and dismissing the butler's frosty reception with her gay laugh and genteel wit. But alas, it was not Grace who presented herself, but the butler, who now ushered them into the hallway. The Earl and Countess will see you in the drawing room, my lord, he said. And Lady Grace? Henry ventured, for he had no intention of leaving without speaking with the object of his intention. Lady Grace is in her chambers, my lord. This way, if you please, the butler replied. Henry had no choice but to follow, even as his heart and head told him something was wrong. He had expected Grace to come and meet him, the shared excitement of a reunion such as young love is meant to enjoy. Have I entirely misread the situation? he wondered. It was disorientating, not only the finding of himself in a new and unfamiliar setting, but filled with new and unfamiliar feelings too. Are you all right, my lord? We're being led through a series of corridors, past imposing portraits and imposing pieces of furniture. We're coming to a door now, oak panelled, Jones whispered. Very well, but I... Henry began, unsure of what to say. This was not as he had expected it to be. The butler, who had not introduced himself, knocked at the door, and a summons from inside bid them enter. This way, sir, the butler said, and the door was opened. Henry's heart was beating fast. Was he expected to make a case for himself before the Earl and Countess? I wish I'd never come. I wish I'd never met her, he thought to himself, growing increasingly anxious as to what was to come. Except he was glad to have met Grace, even if their meeting should now come to nothing. It saddened him to think she may have rejected him, but now he found himself in the drawing room, guided by John, who brought him to a standstill beside a fire, the heat of which was warming his ankles despite the warmth of the day. Lord Henry Howard, my lord, the butler announced. Henry gave a slight bow, nodding his head in what he hoped was the right direction. A shuffling across the rug indicated footsteps, and he held out his hand, which was shook firmly as a voice greeted him curtly. Ah, your lordship. I'm glad to make your acquaintance. My wife and I have heard a considerable amount about you in the previous few days, the earl said. Henry was uncertain how to take these words. Were they compliment or a cause for regret? He could not imagine the sweet, charming, delightful Lady Grace speaking of him in any terms other than of affection. He had been the perfect gentleman, or so he thought. I'm glad to hear it, I hope so at least. I did inform Lady Grace I'd be calling on her today. Perhaps the flowers I sent her haven't arrived, Henry said. There was a scent of flowers in the air, lilies and roses. Henry wished he could ask for a description of the room, but he did not need to see the Earl and Countess to sense their animosity towards him. He did not know what he had done wrong, other than to be less than they expected for their daughter, a fact which caused considerable sorrow. His affliction had been an accident, but it was always the first thing he was judged on, and such judgments had long-lasting implications. I believe they arrived, yes, but I must say I'm not sure they were welcome, the Earl replied. Henry's heart fell, his hopes were dashed, and now he felt a complete and utter fool. It was no wonder Grace had not come to meet him. She had not cared for his gesture of romance, and now she was making her feelings towards him clear. I... I see, 
I can only say how sorry I am for troubling her. But I... Well, we got on so well at the ball the other evening. I thought, well, I hoped I might see Lady Grace again. She was ever so kind, Henry said, his words faltering under his humiliation. Be that as it may, my lord, I think it for the best if the two of you don't see one another again. Another voice and that of the Countess Duttrell replied. I see. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Ever so sorry. I realise I may not be the ideal candidate for the pursuance of further relations, but I hadn't realised I'd done quite so badly in my attempts at charm. I want to assure you, this isn't a frippery. I'm no rake, Henry said. He was feeling angry now. He felt as though Grace had led him a merry dance. Had it all been a game to her? He imagined her laughing behind his back with Miriam. Perhaps she had been laughing at him the whole time, and only pretending to enjoy the dance they had shared together. It made him feel very sad, and despite his lack of vision, tears still welled up in his sightless eyes. It's her first season. She's bound to make mistakes. We can't expect her to achieve perfection immediately, the Countess continued. And I suppose I lack that perfection you seek for her, Henry replied. He was beginning to wonder who it was who had pronounced such judgment against him. Was it Grace herself or her parents who had decided against him? Not at all, my lord, but as her parents we must do what we believe to be best for Grace, the Earl said. Then I'm sorry to have troubled you in this way, Henry said. He wanted only to leave and never to return to Dilbury Park. He would shut himself away and never seek the company of the Tarn for as long as he lived. Society was abhorrent, and even what appeared to be the best of it was nothing but false appearances and deceit. This way, my lord, Jones whispered, taking Henry by the arm. Good day, my lord, the earl said, and the door of the drawing room was opened, presumably by the butler. Thank you for your kind hospitality, Henry replied through gritted teeth. This way, sir, the butler said, and the tap of his shoes echoed across the marble floor. Take me home, Jonies, Henry said feeling as though his heart was about to break. Grace tried the door for the tenth time that morning. It was still locked, and the window she now returned to was far too high to jump from. Looking down on the forecourt of the house, far below, Grace could see the carriage belonging to Henry, and there was Henry himself being led by his valet. Grace tried to pull up the sill. She would have shouted if she could, even as she knew the trouble it would get her into but the window was fastened shut, and all she could do was watch in desperation as Henry's carriage drove away. Why didn't they at least let me speak to him? she exclaimed, banging her fists on the sill with such force the window pane rattled. With a further effort, Grace managed to pull up the sill, but her cries went unheard, and sighing, she rested her head on her arms, leaning out of the window and looking down at the forecourt below. Her parents had been cruel, and Grace could surely imagine the sorrow Henry was now feeling, for it was that of her own too. Cruel, unnecessarily cruel, Grace said to herself, closing the window and sinking down into a chair by the unlit fire with a sigh. A short while later a key was turned in the lock and Grace's mother opened the door. Grace scowled at her. Lord Henry came to visit us this morning, she said as though Grace was entirely unaware of the fact. I saw his carriage. What did he say? Grace asked. He came because, well, to inform us there'd been a misunderstanding, the Countess replied. Grace looked at her in surprise. She could not imagine what sort of misunderstanding her mother could be referring to. The note with the flowers had been clear enough. Henry intended to visit and as Grace understood it when a gentleman called on a young lady after meeting at a ball, it meant he desired the pursuance of a courtship. This was what Grace wanted, 
At least she believed she did, given her limited experience in such matters. What sort of misunderstanding? she asked, and her mother sighed. Well, I think he believed you were under the impression of a fledgling romance between the two of you. He came to inform your father and I of his true intentions. He was merely being friendly towards you at the ball. He could see you were in some distress as to your previous encounters and wanted only to offer a kind gesture towards you, the Countess said. Grace looked at her mother in astonishment. This was not what she had expected Henry to say. I... but I don't understand. I thought... she began. But her mother smiled. It's natural to misunderstand these sorts of situations, Grace. It's your debut, your first season. You're a budding rose, not an experienced wallflower. A gentleman's kindness can be interpreted in many ways. I applaud Lord Henry for his honesty. He sent the flowers as a gesture of gratitude. He wished you well for the coming season, the Countess said. Grace was confused and she felt upset too at the thought how readily she had misread the signs. Henry's lack of sight had proved a barrier to understanding his feelings. Without eye contact, the gaze of another, it had proved harder to ascertain what he was thinking. Oh, I've made a fool of myself, haven't I? Grace thought to herself, even as her mother continued. You weren't to know, Grace, it's all too easy to misread the signs. I think you've learned your lesson. There's no need for you to stay in your chambers any longer. We can still go to the balls and other gatherings as planned, she said, smiling at Grace, who nodded. I, well, I just thought... I liked him, that's all, Grace said. She was fighting back the tears in her eyes, not wanting her mother to see the upset this, her first rejection, had caused. I know, but a blind man, a penniless man, it's for the best, Grace. Fortunately, his intentions weren't as we feared, the Countess said. Grace pulled out her handkerchief and dabbed her eyes. She had not expected the force with which her emotions now overwhelmed her. Her mother came to put her arms around her. I thought he was different. I really thought he liked me and that he was coming to... Grace began, her words trailing off. She had allowed herself to be caught up in the fantasy of courtship and proposal. But her mother was right. She was in the first flush of her first season. She should not expect a miracle, even as she had hoped for something more to come of her encounter with Henry. Oh, Grace, that's not how these things work. You danced with Lord Henry and he sent you some flowers. I'm sure it was very nice of him. But come now, it's time for luncheon. We're having sole and a soup. We can talk about the ball as Ashworth on Saturday. It's going to be a wonderful evening. Dry your eyes and come with me. Your father's waiting, the Countess said, taking Grace by the hand and leading her from the room. Her short period of imprisonment was ended, but Grace could not help but feel a prisoner still, imprisoned by her emotions, which at that moment seemed overwhelming, and by her mother's overbearingness towards her. Will I see him again? she asked and her mother turned to her and smiled. I don't think so, Grace, the Countess replied, and Grace could only feel despairing at the thought of finding far more Sir Reginalds than Lord Henry's in the season to come. Chapter 9 Henry was dejected. He had hardly spoke during the carriage ride home, and as Jones helped him down from the compartment, he shook his head and sighed. What a miserable day it's been, Jones he said. I'm sorry, my lord. She led you a merry dance, both at the ball and since, the valet replied. I was a fool to think anyone would consider me above the others. But she seemed so genuine in her affections. I suppose when one can't see, one rather reads into apparent other signs. Perhaps my senses aren't as attuned as I believe them to be, Henry said, as the valet led him up the steps and into the house. Henry had always considered himself an excellent judge of character. He noticed things others missed, a tone of voice, a mannerism or phrase, 
He had thought he recognised in Grace a genuine kindness, an affection, a gentleness. But he had been wrong. We all misread the signs at times, my lord, Jones said. Well, I shan't be doing it again, I finished with women. With balls, soirees, seasons and all the rest. Burn every invitation I receive, Jones, and if any young ladies come calling, tell them I've gone away and I'm never coming back, Henry replied. In that moment, he would gladly have become a hermit and lived as a recluse for the rest of his life. Without his sight, Henry often felt as though he was in his own world, cut off from those around him. And now, he vowed to retreat into that world and never emerge from it. His heart was close to breaking, fragile as cut glass, and he had no intention of allowing it so to be. Very good, my lord, Jones replied. Is there any correspondence today? Henry asked, as Jones led him into the drawing room. A letter from your aunt, my lord, Jones replied. Henry was surprised. He enjoyed a cordial relationship with his aunt and uncle, but he rarely heard from them the occasional exchange of letters enough to keep up familial ties. They lived some miles from Burnley on the family estate, and Henry had heard nothing from them since Easter. You'd better open it for me, Jones, Henry said. The valet helped him into a chair by the fire and Henry sat back, listening to the scrunching of paper as the envelope was opened and the letter unfolded. My dear Henry, how long it has been since last we corresponded, and in that time your uncle's health has deteriorated to such an extent. I'm now forced to take up my quill and write to you. By the time you receive this letter, it may be too late, and the title of Duke of Crawshaw may already be yours through tragic circumstance. I implore you to come to your uncle's bedside at once, with love, Aunt Helena. Jones read. The letter was swift and to the point. Henry raised his eyebrows. He had not known of his uncle's illness. He was still a young man, young by aristocratic standards at least, and had always been in rude health. Henry had not expected his demise for at least another twenty years, and to receive such news as this was astonishing. He and his uncle had never been close, and whilst his aunt could write in kind-hearted tones, she too had always been somewhat distant. Goodness me! I'd never have thought it. Jones! Henry exclaimed. The emotional distance between him and his uncle was such that news of his illness did not bring with it tremendous upset. Henry could feel sorry for the Duke, but as for rushing to his bedside in sad lament, as his aunt requested, Will you go, my lord? Jones asked. I suppose I must. That sounds churlish of me. I'll go, of course I'll go, but I hadn't expected it. Another sudden death, just like my parents. How awful, my poor aunt. If my uncle does die, then I'm the heir. The dukedom passes to me. I'm not ready for that, Henry replied, feeling fearful, his thoughts turning to the memory of the day his parents died. It felt strange to think of himself as the inheritor of a considerable fortune, when he lived on such a meagre income as his uncle afforded him now. He was a gentleman, but one in genteel poverty viewed as an eccentric. And without the necessary means to live up to expectations, the poor relation, relying on charity. I'll have the carriage prepared once more, Jones said, and Henry nodded. He could not quite believe what was happening, even as there was no doubting his aunt's words. This changed everything, and Henry thought back to the strange encounter with Grace's parents at Dillsbury Park. They had insinuated he was not good enough for their daughter, not only because of his affliction, but because of his lowly position in society, a view surely shared by Grace too, given her strange refusal to even see him. Now with title, lands and wealth, Henry would surely find himself at the centre of many attentions, not least those young women eager to secure a match and better their position. Well, if she didn't want me before, she's not having me now, he thought to himself, glad to have proved his worth in the face of Grace's dismissal. But even as repeated this to himself, he found it difficult to believe. 
Either Grace was an actor worthy of the Covent Garden stage, or there was more to the story than met the eye. And as he rode in his carriage towards the estate which was now in his inherit, Henry could not help but feel a piece of the puzzle was missing. Your aunt's waiting for you in the drawing room, Your Grace, the butler said, as he opened the door to Henry and Jones a short while later. Henry gripped his valet's arm. Did you... address me as... he began. I did, Your Grace, the butler replied, and Henry let out a deep sigh. The words meant death, the passing of the title. There was no ceremony, no period of transition. Hereditary was simple. At death the title passed, and the title was now Henry's. Jones led him into the house, but Henry needed no description of his ancestral home. He knew it like the back of his hand, and had it not been for a rearrangement of furniture placing a table in his way, he could have found his way to the drawing room unaided. My uncle dead, Henry whispered. My sincerest condolences, my lord, your grace, Jones replied. Henry was still in shock. He could hardly comprehend the responsibilities which were now his, even as he knew he had to bear them. He had been satisfied with his quiet life, the occasional foray into romance notwithstanding. But now, his life was about to change. It had changed by virtue of his uncle's death. As he was shown into the drawing room, Henry could hear his aunt sobbing, and as he cleared his throat, she came hurrying to meet him. He slipped away so quickly, Henry. There was nothing anyone could do. One moment, he was with us the next. He was gone. Oh, poor Algernon, she wept, throwing her arms around Henry, who was uncertain as to what he should say or do. His aunt was a slight creature, and she clung to Henry, who put his arms around her, trying his best to comfort her. I'm sorry, Aunt Helena, truly I am, he said. Oh, it wasn't meant to be so soon. The plans we had, the hopes we harboured, all gone, she cried, descending into further incomprehensible sobs. I'm only sorry I didn't arrive sooner, Henry said, though he would not have known what to say if he had done so. He and his uncle had never seen eye to eye. And whilst open hostility had been avoided, there could be no claims to fraternal closeness on either side. His aunt and uncle had never truly understood Henry's affliction. It was not that they refused sympathy after the accident which had killed his parents, but as for understanding how blindness affected Henry in his day-to-day -day life, they had shown little by way of sympathy. He slipped away quite suddenly, but what a cruel illness it was, Henry, his aunt exclaimed. I'll do whatever I can for you, I promise, Henry replied, and there was a genuine intention on his part to do so. Henry knew all too well the pain of death, and still he missed his parents terribly. But the death of his uncle was a more practical affair, and Henry knew it would fall to him to make the necessary arrangements for the funeral and the period of mourning. There was much to do, and Henry was uncertain where to begin. Your uncle wanted you to inherit the dukedom, Henry. You know that, don't you? There's no question of your right to do so, his aunt said. We can talk about that later, Aunt Helena. Why don't you sit down now, Henry said. He could picture the scene in his mind's eye. The drawing room as he had known it as a child, with the peacock wallpaper and large pieces of oriental furniture his grandfather had brought back from expeditions to the east. A large portrait of a distant duke hung over the fireplace, and doors opened onto the terrace looking over the garden, the warmth of the later summer afternoon wafting in the scent of roses and lavender. I just don't know what to do without him, Henry's aunt said, and Henry reached out as she took his hand in hers. It was difficult to find the right words to say. Aunt Helena was practically a stranger, even as she was the closest thing Henry now had to a family. It's still so new, Aunt Helena. It's... Well, these things take time, 
You can't expect to feel anything but grief, Henry replied. Henry remembered the day his uncle had told him his parents had died. He had not understood at first, refusing to believe it, even as his uncle repeated the facts to him. Ever since, Henry had asked why he had not died too, only to be left with this terrible affliction. There were days he would gladly have perished in the carriage accident, and days he was glad to have survived. It was all a matter of perspective, and in times of tragedy, such perspective could be hard to achieve. Oh, Henry, are you ready for this responsibility? his aunt asked. Henry knew he had no choice but to shoulder the responsibility now passed to him. He was the Duke of Crawshaw, and with it came many responsibilities. A man with sight might have found those responsibilities daunting, but for Henry, and the matter of his inheritance brought with it all manner of new difficulties to navigate. I have to be, Aunt Helena. I don't have a choice, Henry replied. And I'm sure you'll live up to that responsibility, Henry, she replied. Henry was glad of this vote of confidence, ever as he himself felt entirely inadequate in the face of it. He passed an awkward hour or so with his aunt, speaking of a man he barely knew but whose legacy he was now expected to live in. I'll call on you in the coming days, Aunt Helena. We'll need to make the arrangements for the funeral, but that can wait for now, Henry said, as he bid his aunt farewell. I'm sorry, Henry, we let you down, didn't we? His aunt said, but Henry shook his head. We each had our burdens to bear, Aunt Helena, he replied. Back in his carriage, Henry sat back and sighed. His whole life had changed in an instant, and it would take time to come to terms with it. He was confused as to what the future held, even as he was determined to prove himself in the face of it. If I might say so, my lord and your grace, you've taken this tragic news rather well, Jones said as the carriage pulled off. Henry smiled. After losing one's sight, Jones, most other things seem rather less concerning. I'll mourn my uncle, of course, but as for the practicalities, I'm sure we can manage them. But I'm going to rely on you a great deal more, Jones. You're not just my valet. You're my most trusted companion, Henry said. You can count on me, Your Grace. I'll do whatever I can to help you, I promise, the valet replied. Henry was grateful to Jones for his loyalty. There were few people he could trust, and even those who had appeared trustworthy in the past could so easily prove to be false. The case of Lady Grace was a prime example. Henry smiled to himself at the thought of what the Earl and Countess would think when news of his inheritance reached them. They couldn't possibly deny my suitability then. Only their prejudice could prevent them from accepting me, he thought to himself. But as he made his way home that day, burdened now with this fresh and unexpected responsibility, Henry could not help but wonder again about Lady Grace and the truth behind her refusal. Chapter 10 Grace had not stopped thinking about Henry since her mother's curious announcement concerning his visit. She was confused and disappointed. More than that, she felt a fool for allowing her emotions to run away with her. She was worried Henry might have thought her averse to his affliction when the opposite was true. Grace could see beyond Henry's sight loss, and what she saw had, in every way, delighted her. You must try to put him out of your mind, Grace, her mother had told her when Grace had complained as to her confusion over Henry's visit. I don't understand why he should send the flowers if he wasn't interested in pursuing a match, Grace had replied. Her mother had dismissed her worries as mere confusion, reminding her she was but a budding flower rather than an ageing wall plant. It was only natural for a debutante to misread the signs, and given Lord Henry's affliction he could not possibly intend romance. Grace had not entirely understood why her mother should think a man without his sight would automatically be a man with no wish to marry, but there was little point in questioning her mother, and instead she wrote again to Miriam, hoping her friend might provide a more reasoned response. I'll come tomorrow, Miriam wrote in a brief missive, which assured Grace she was not to worry. 
Grace was now awaiting her friend's arrival and had asked for a tray of tea and dainty cakes to be set in the drawing room. Miriam's carriage had just arrived and Grace was eager to hear what her friend had to say. He came then, Miriam said, sweeping into the drawing room a few moments later. She was dressed in a pretty blue dress and a wide-brimmed bonnet covered in delicate silk flowers. Miriam was always effortlessly pretty. Yes, but as I said in my letter, he didn't speak to me, he told my parents, she began, but Miriam interrupted her. Nonsense, it's all nonsense. He can't have done. He sent you those flowers. He was besotted with you. I was there. I saw it at the ball. He's in love with you. I don't understand what's got into him, Miriam exclaimed. Grace did not understand either, but she had hoped Miriam might have been able to cast some light on the matter. She was acquainted with Henry. They were friends, and if Grace had done something to upset him, she hoped Miriam could tell her what it was. I just don't understand. My parents weren't keen on the match. They practically forbade it, but once it was known he wasn't interested, they quite changed their opinion of him. Or so it seemed, Grace said. It was this which had caused her confusion. Her parents had been so adamantly against Henry, and when he had proved uninterested in pursuing a courtship, their attitude had changed. It had caused her to be suspicious, even as she could do nothing to allay that suspicion. I can't believe he wasn't interested. You're the perfect possibility for him. Kind, gentle, intelligent, understanding. It's ridiculous. I'll speak to him myself, Miriam replied. Grace was uncertain this was the right course of action. She did not want to embarrass herself further, and it would be humiliating to discover Henry really did have no interest in her romantically. I... I don't know about that, Miriam. Are you sure that's a good idea? I don't want to cause offence, Grace said, but it was clear Miriam's mind was already made up. There's no offence to be caused. Either he's behaving ridiculously, or there's more to it than meets the eye. We have to be certain, Miriam said, helping herself to one of the dainty cakes on the tray between them. Despite her fears, Grace was grateful to Miriam for doing what she herself never could, and with a plan now formed, the two women finished their tea and exchanged further news. I fear it means far more, Sir Reginald's for me, Grace said as she lamented the possibilities put forward by her mother. You don't have to put up with that, Grace. Marry who you want to marry, pursue love, not folly, Miriam said. Grace smiled. Miriam was always forthright with her opinion, but she was Grace's dearest and most trusted friend on whom she could rely to guide her through this most difficult time. And what of you, Miriam? I feel we always talk about me and never about you. What of your prospects? Grace asked. Miriam sighed and shook her head. A sudden look of sorrow came over her face and a far-off look came into her eyes. I, well, things aren't easy at the moment. I haven't spoken about it, but... Oh, I shouldn't be critical. There are people far worse off than I, she said. Grace was concerned. Miriam always seemed so confident, so sure of herself and the future. To see this look on her face and hear her words was upsetting, and Grace reached out and took her friend by the hand. Is it something we can talk about? Has someone upset you? she asked, but Miriam shook her head. No, it's nothing like that. It's my father. He's made some poor decisions, financial things. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about, she said. But Grace squeezed her hand. The Baron of Mowbray was a good man, but she knew his business dealings to be somewhat erratic. She had heard her father speak of them on many occasions. He made poor investments, and whilst his legacy was a wealthy one, he had failed to capitalise on his assets. But you are worried, Miriam, she said, and her friend nodded. I fear for myself and my sister too. Without a brother we've no one to support should the worst happen but there's no need to concern yourself with my worries, Grace. You've got your own, and it'll be a welcome distraction to help you with them. I'll visit Henry, I'll get to the bottom of this, I promise, she said, 
pulling out a handkerchief and wiping the tears from her eyes. Grace nodded. She was grateful to Miriam for helping her in this way, even as she was now concerned as to Miriam's own prospects for the future. Only, if you're sure. I want you to be happy too, Miriam, she said, and Miriam smiled. I'm sure I will be. I just need to find my own Lord Henry, that's all, she replied. Miriam rose to her feet, and Grace did the same, the two friends bidding one another goodbye with the promise of a return visit later in the week. I don't want to be embarrassed, but I do want to know the truth, Grace said, as Miriam departed. And you will do. I promise, Miriam assured her. Having seen Miriam out, Grace returned to the drawing room, standing at the window and looking out over the gardens. Life had been simple before her debut, but the simplicity of childhood could not last, and Grace knew the future would be complicated. She would be terribly sad if Miriam's questioning of Lord Henry led to the same conclusions her mother had spoken of, but if there was a glimmer of hope in the possibility of something more, then Grace was only too glad to seize it. I just want to hear it from him, she thought to herself, looking out at the beauty of the garden and longing to offer some of that beauty to Lord Henry in whatever way she could. Chapter 11 From the House of Lords, Your Grace, details of upcoming business in Parliament. Shall I summarise it for you? Jones asked. Henry groaned. He had been wading through correspondence all morning, trying to make arrangements for his uncle's funeral, whilst dealing with the many responsibilities which were now his. I'll see to it tomorrow. Let's concentrate on the funeral for now. I didn't think it would be this complicated. There'll be a memorial service in London at a later date. But I don't think anything elaborate needs to happen here, do you? Henry replied. His uncle had been an influential man, and since news of his death had spread, condolences had poured in from every corner of the nation. I think there might be an expectation of a more ceremonial gathering, Your Grace, Jones replied. Henry rolled his eyes. It was all so complicated. I hope someone has as much bother when I die as I'm having, he said, and the valet laughed. You're doing an excellent job, Your Grace. We'll work it out together. Now, what can I read to you next? Jones asked. Henry would be lost without his trusted valet, and he was grateful to Jones for all he had done for him since his uncle's death. The news of the inheritance was now widely known, and with the affairs of the estate having passed to Henry immediately, he had little time for distractions. The matter of Lady Grace and her parents had been pushed aside, even as Henry felt the hurt of her dismissal acutely. In a way, he had been glad of these distractions, for they had given him something else to think about than a fragile heart. I think my personal correspondence, please, Jones. Something other than parliamentary business and invoices, he said. The valet opened another letter, with the sound of the paper tearing as the letter knife slid beneath the seal. Henry sat back, but just as Jones began to read, a letter from a very distant cousin assuring Henry of her condolences, and inquiring as to the contents of the will. A knock came at the study door. I beg your pardon, Your Grace, but there's a lady to see you. I've shown her into the drawing room, the maid whose name was Shirley said. Henry kept only a small staff, Jones, Shirley, and a cook. He had no butler or footman, even as his rank now demanded such things. He had not yet moved from his modest lodgings to the estate, and the house was in chaos. Henry sat up in surprise. He had vowed not to receive any young ladies, even as he was surprised one should be calling on him. Who is it, Shirley? Did she offer a card? Henry asked. Lady Miriam Kendall. Your Grace, the maid replied. Henry smiled. He had been expecting Miriam to call, and he was only too happy to receive her, though the vow would remain towards any other visitors. Take me through, Jones. I think I'm safe with Lady Miriam, he said. The scent of Miriam's perfume hung in the air, 
as Henry crossed the hallway. He was glad of a chance to speak with her, if only to tell her what he thought of Grace's odd behaviour. She was the thread between them, a friend to both, and presumably with an opinion to share. What on earth did you think you were doing? Miriam exclaimed as Henry was led into the drawing room. Henry was somewhat taken aback by this verbal assault and paused, turning towards the sound which was coming from across the room by the window. I... Miriam, what do you mean? he asked, feeling thoroughly confused. You know precisely what I mean. Telling Grace you wished only for friendship with her, that she misunderstood your intentions towards her at the ball, that the flowers were only a gesture of kindness. What nonsense! You've broken her heart. She's devastated, Miriam exclaimed. Henry gasped. This was all a lie, pure and simple. He had said nothing of the sort to Grace's parents. But you're wrong, Miriam. It was Grace who dismissed me. She told me she didn't want to see me. I went to the house. I spoke with her parents. They were adamant about it. I presumed she'd changed her mind. A change of heart due to my affliction. I went there intending to court her, to propose marriage even, Henry replied. He was shocked by this revelation. A blatant lie as to his intentions. Proposing marriage may have been rash, but Henry had certainly intended to declare his affections. He had never met a woman like Grace before, and he was certain he would not meet one like her again. How could he possibly have spoken such words to her after all they had shared together at the ball? Did you? That's not what she says, Miriam replied. Shall we sit down? Henry said. He did not like arguing in a doorway and Jones led him to a chair, inviting Miriam to sit opposite. I'll leave you, Your Grace. Ring the bell for my return, Jones said, and Henry nodded. As the door closed, Henry shook his head. I didn't say anything of the sort. I went to Dilbury Park with the intention of seeing Grace and telling her of my affections for her. That's why I sent the flowers, a precursor to my intentions. When I arrived, I was shown into the drawing room by an imperious-sounding butler and met by the Earl and Countess. They told me Grace had no wish to see me, and that was that. I could make no argument, and so I left. But now you come here accusing me of breaking her heart, Henry said. His conscience was clear. His intentions had been nothing but sincere, and now he felt terribly upset at the thought of hurting the one person on whom his affections now rested. I knew it. Oh, I see the hand of the Countess in this. You're certain you went there with that intention, Miriam said. Yes. Why would I lie? I never thought I'd meet a woman like Grace, not one who'd accept my affliction so readily. Henry replied. She tells a different story, that you went to Dilbury Park and told her parents there'd been a misunderstanding, that you were happy to be on friendly terms and that was that. She's terribly upset she was hoping you'd propose a courtship, Miriam said. Henry now saw the hand of the Countess too. Both he and Grace had each been manipulated, and no doubt the Countess had no idea of the mutual thread connecting him with Miriam so that now the truth was discovered. One was rejected, the other told of a misunderstanding, a parting of ways. How terrible, Henry exclaimed. He felt suddenly very sad, knowing the Earl and Countess were the ones who had decided the fate of him and Grace. Neither of them had been allowed to choose, nor express their burgeoning feelings for one another. Terrible, indeed. But what are we going to do about it? Miriam replied. I suppose you've heard the news about my uncle, Henry asked. I was sad to hear it. My father's written to you, expressing his condolences. I was sad to think of the burden of responsibility passed to you, and to think of what you've already suffered and must suffer now. You've already endured so much, and to think of you enduring this now, well, it's terribly sad. Miriam said. Henry was grateful to her for her words, but a sense of determination had now come over him. 
He knew he could not bear the burden of this new responsibility alone, but with the support of another, a woman he loved, surely it was possible. But I shouldn't endure it alone. And if what you say about Grace is true, I don't have to, Henry said. Precisely so. You don't have to endure it alone, Henry. But you must be bold. Grace's parents told a wicked lie. You can't let them away with it. Go to Dilbury Park. Tell her you love her, Miriam said. Henry could only imagine the frosty reception he would receive if he went to Dilbury Park that day. Grace's parents would surely dismiss him. But if only he could speak to Grace herself, perhaps then the matter could be resolved and the truth could be known. And you really think she'll say the same? Does she know of my inheritance? he asked. Miriam took his hand in hers and squeezed it. She doesn't care about any inheritance, though her parents might. She saw past your affliction, Henry, as any decent person does. She saw you for you, the kind, gentle, charming, caring, intelligent man who happens to be blind. Don't let that one thing define you or hold you back. We're more than the sum of our parts, and certainly more than those things we think matter the most. Often they don't. Be bold, Henry. You both deserve this happiness, Miriam replied. Henry smiled. He had been so caught up in his inheritance, but now he realised the terrible hurt he had carried since Grace's apparent rejection. He had felt certain there was more to it than he knew, and now the truth about the Earl and Countess was revealed. But Henry was not about to back down. He would do as Miriam said and go to Dilbury Park in the hope of finding the answers he needed. You're right, Miriam. I rather thought my prospects of happiness were at an end, that I'd never know the same happiness as my sighted friends. I may not be able to see Grace, but with every other sense, I know I love her. I don't need to see her to fall in love with her, Henry replied. Miriam squeezed his hand once again. And that's a gift to cherish, Henry. You see things others don't. Not with your eyes, but with all your other senses. It's a remarkable thing, she said. Henry was grateful to Miriam and now his mind was made up. He would go to Dilbury Park and he would tell Grace of his feelings for her. He had nothing to lose and everything to gain and having bid Miriam goodbye, he summoned Jones to the drawing room. Make ready the carriage, Jones. We leave for Dilbury Park at once. I've got a plan, a plan so ridiculous it might just work, he said, smiling to himself at the prospect of what was to come and hopeful of a happy resolution. The Twelve You've hardly touched your dinner this evening, Grace. Is something wrong? her mother asked. Grace looked up from the piece of mutton she had been pushing around her plate and met her mother's eye. I'm quite all right, mother, she replied, and her mother raised her eyebrows. They had been at dinner for the past hour, and Grace had hardly said a word. She felt sad, sadder than she had ever felt before. Her mother had told her to forget Henry and concentrate on the future, but try as she might, Grace could think only of her foolishness in misreading what she had believed to be the beginning of a romance. No, you're not. You're pandering for Lord Henry. I can see it in your eyes. You mustn't let every man you dance with break your heart, Grace. That's how you become miserable, her mother said, shaking her head. Grace's father remained silent. He rarely interfered in disagreements between Grace and her mother. Women's problems were not his. And now he set down his knife and fork and pushed his plate forward, a footman hurrying to take it away. Then I'll be miserable, Grace replied, shrugging her shoulders. Her mother tutted. Say something to her, Charles, Grace's mother said, turning to her husband with an exasperated look on her face. Grace's father cleared his throat. There are two things wrong with Lord Henry, Grace. He can't see and he can't provide. He's penniless and a blind man won't ever be anything else than that, he said. Grace looked at her father angrily. He knew nothing of Henry, and yet he would judge him on appearance and hearsay without a second thought. Do you think I care? 
she asked. Her father made an exasperated noise. He came here to offer the hand of friendship, Grace. I can't do anything about his feelings for you. And it's not up to you to care or not. I'm your father and I'll decide what's best for you, he replied. The Countess made a noise in her throat. And, she said, raising her eyebrows at Grace's father, who looked suddenly uncomfortable. Along with your mother, he replied. Grace rose from the table, tossing her napkin aside, and not waiting to be excused, she left the dining room, slamming the door behind her. Tears welled up in her eyes. She simply could not believe Henry had done such a thing. And whilst it was a terrible thing to think, Grace suspected her parents of deceit. They just don't want me marrying for love, that's all, she said to herself, making her way up to bed and locking herself in her bedroom. Dusk was falling, and Grace readied herself for bed, not waiting for the maid, and climbed beneath the blankets, pulling them tightly around her. She felt terribly sad, and a tear rolled down her cheek. She pictured Henry, his smiling face, his cinnamon-coloured hair, the piercing blue of his eyes the way he had described the ballroom in such detail, even without sight. He fascinated her, and she longed for just a moment in his company to express the feelings which had risen with such force. But I won't even get that, she thought to herself, rolling onto her side and closing her eyes. Sleep was coming over her, but at that moment a sound startled her. She sat up and looked around. There it was again at the window the sound of gravel hitting the pane and climbing out of bed, Grace hurried to pull back the curtains. Her bedroom was high up and looked down on the forecourt below. The moon was high in the sky, casting its silvery light over the house and grounds. Two figures were standing there, and now another piece of gravel clattered against the pane. It can't be! Grace exclaimed out loud, and fumbling with the latch, the window still stiff, she managed to open it. Lady Grace, is that you? Henry called out. Yes, I'm here, but how did you know where I'd be? She exclaimed, astonished to hear Henry's voice after all her parents had told her. I had Jones make inquiries of the servants in the kitchen. I'm sorry for the strange manner in which I've been forced to speak with you. I didn't think I'd have much luck seeking an audience by more conventional means, he replied. Grace was overjoyed. She had wanted him to come, she had longed for him to come, and now her dreams had come true. But I don't understand why you've come. You were here only a few days ago, I thought you... Grace began, her words trailing off, for she did not know precisely what to say. She could not assume his intentions even as she longed to hear her hopes realised. It's not true, Grace, is it? You wanted to see me as I wanted to see you? Henry called out. Yes, I was waiting for you. And then my mother told me you were only being friendly at the ball, and that nothing more was to be said of it, Grace replied. That's not at all what I said, Grace. I wanted to tell you, oh, can you come down? We can't shout to one another like this. Henry said, and Grace nodded. I'll come. Wait there, she replied, and pulling on a shawl and snatching up a candle, she slipped out of her bedroom, hurrying downstairs in her nightgown and crossing the silent, moonlit hallway, letting herself out of the front door of the house and onto the forecourt. Henry and his valet were waiting there, and Grace rushed over to them, seizing Henry by the hand. I knew you wouldn't be so cruel, Grace. I knew you wanted to see me as I longed to see you, Henry exclaimed. The valet took a few steps back, leaving Grace and Henry alone. Tears welled up in Grace's eyes, and she raised Henry's hands to her lips. I'm so sorry. I can't imagine how you must have felt. The same way I felt, I suppose, it was awful. I thought, but Miriam told me everything. I had to come. I had to see you. Well... Not see you, but... Henry stammered. It's all right, you're here now. That's all that matters, Grace exclaimed. I had to come. I've thought of nothing else but you since Miriam told me the truth. I'm so sorry, he repeated, 
but Grace shook her head. You don't need to be sorry about anything. It's not you that's at fault, she replied, glancing back towards the house. She was angry with her parents. They had no right to dictate her feelings in this way. Their prejudice against Henry was clear, and now Grace saw through their lies. When we danced together at the ball, the evening we spent together, it was like no other I'd ever known. You're like no woman I've ever known, Grace. I can't describe it. I only know I've fallen in love with you, as foolish as it sounds, Henry replied. Tears welled up in Grace's eyes, and she clasped his hands in hers, knowing her own feelings were just the same. It's not foolish, not at all. My mother tried to make out as though I was mistaken, that my feelings were confused. I'm just a debutante, she said, and liable to make mistakes in matters of the heart. But, with you, there was no mistake. I knew precisely what I was doing. I love you too, and I want this wonderful feeling to continue, she exclaimed. There was no doubt in Grace's mind as to the truth of love at first sight. That moment at the ball, the evening they had spent together. It was meant to be, and despite the obstacles placed in their path, happiness could now be theirs. Caught up in the moment, Grace was overjoyed. The sorrow she had felt, the sadness of the past few days. All that was gone, replaced with a sense of possibility for a future she had thought snatched from her by cruel circumstance. I wonder, would you allow me to place my hands on your face, Grace? I can see you then, even as surely I know just what you're like already, Henry said. Grace smiled, and taking his hands, she guided them to her cheeks. Gently, Henry ran his fingers across her face, a smile coming over his countenance. He pushed back her hair, tracing a trail to her shoulders with his hands. Can you see me? she asked, and he smiled. And you're more beautiful than I ever imagined, he said. She was about to reply when the door to the house opened and a shout came from the top of the steps. Grace, what's going on? What are you doing? Her mother's shrill voice called out. Grace turned to see her parents advancing towards them, and now she took a deep breath, turning and standing her ground with Henry at her side. You lied to me, mother. You told me Lord Henry only wanted to be friends, she exclaimed. Her mother looked at her angrily. We did what we thought was best, Grace, she retorted. Because of prejudice, mother, Grace said. Her mother and father looked at one another, but before either of them could reply, Henry spoke up. My lord, your ladyship, I can only assure you of my good intentions towards your daughter. I hold her in the greatest of regards, and if only you'd permit me to prove myself to you, I believe you might change your mind about me. See beyond my affliction, if you will, he said. Tears welled up in Grace's eyes. There should have been no need for Henry to justify himself. He had nothing to prove. He had already shown himself to be the kindest and noblest of men. He had fought for her and proved the love he spoke of. Grace looked at her parents imploringly. I've a duty to my daughter, sir. I can't allow her to marry a penniless blind man, the Earl said. His tone was angry and dismissive. But to Grace's surprise, Henry laughed. Haven't you heard? he asked. Grace's father looked at him in surprise. Heard what? he asked. I may be blind, but I'm no longer penniless. My uncle succumbed to a sudden fever two days ago. He died of it. The title, the estate, the wealth, the entire inheritance passed to me. I'm no longer Lord Henry, the penniless blind man. I'm Henry the Duke of Crawshaw, and the one thing I see clearly is my love for your daughter and her love for me, Henry replied. Grace's parents stared at them both in astonishment, and Grace too was surprised by this extraordinary revelation. She had heard nothing of Henry's uncle's decline, and news of his death came as a shock. 
Henry was the Duke of Crawshaw, and that meant he was now far richer and more influential than her own father, who, as Earl, Henry now outranked. Well, I... I suppose... Grace's father stammered. That changes everything, Grace said as Henry smiled. Won't you at least give us a chance at happiness? Henry asked. Grace looked imploringly at her mother. There could surely be no denial of this opportunity. There was nothing false or mistaken in her feelings for Henry. She had fallen in love with him, and this moment was surely the beginning of something wonderful for them both. Her mother sighed and nodded. Any man who fights for my daughter as you have, Lord Henry, deserves a second chance, she replied. And Grace smiled as she breathed a sigh of relief. Her parents returned inside, issuing an invitation to Henry to dine with them in the coming days and offering their condolences for his loss. Grace slipped her hand into Henry's and squeezed it. Thank you, she whispered. And he smiled. Thank you, Grace. You saw beyond what so many others see, he replied, putting her arms around him. I saw the man you are, kind, gentle, loving, witty, charming. I saw the man I fell in love with in a moment, she replied. And what do you see now, he asked, as she rested her head on his chest. I see a bright future for us both, she replied, knowing they would both see happiness together. Read Ralph's story now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks.